How are you? Very good. Thank you. Good morning, Dr. Hector. Let's get people going here. Okay. Yep. Let's give them uh, like, I got 857. Good morning, everybody. I'm Dick Berner. I teach here at Stern, and it's our pleasure to welcome all of you here this morning for the Alternative Reference Rates Committee Roundtable. Um, my job is simple this morning. I'm here to introduce Raghu Sundaram, who is the Dean of the Stern School, uh, and then Philip Schnabel, who is the uh, head of the Solomon Center uh, at Stern for the study of financial institutions. They are going to welcome you this morning. Following that, we'll have a video from Vice Chair Randy Quarles at the Fed, and then Tom Whiff, Chair of the ARC, uh, will take over the meeting. Thank you very much. Raghu. Thank you, Dick, and good morning, everybody. 
Um, as Dick said, I'm Raghu Sundaram. I'm the St Dean of the Stern School of Business, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all here this morning for the June meeting of the ARRC. Um, we are very pleased to be co-hosting this uh, meeting with the New York Fed and the Board of Governors. This is a, the, a partnership with the Fed is one we treasure, and this is one of many fruitful collaborations we've had with them over the years. So I'm also very pleased to welcome the other official sponsors of the committee, members of the committee, and all of you out here today. The uh, size of this audience alone reveals what an important topic we are dealing with today. Um, and in, especially for that reason, we at Stern are delighted to be part of this. Stern has always prided itself on having one of the world's strongest departments in finance, on, being, on working very closely with regulatory institutions and markets in identifying fruitful ways forward. And this is something we are very interested in working with on the next steps. So obviously, thinking of identifying alternatives to LIBOR is only one step. Implementing them is the next step. Um, and implementing them is probably the most important step. And as part of our collaboration in helping this venture succeed, we are delighted to welcome all of you here today. Um, the start of summer is supposed to be a very quiet period in academia. So when Dick approached me with, uh, with the idea of hosting this conference here as the first week of summer, I was absolutely delighted. I said, what a, what a good way to open summer. Unfortunately, as it turns out, I have three conferences I'm opening this morning alone. So to my regret, I won't be able to be here this morning. But my apologies to all of you for skipping out right now. Let me introduce my colleague, Philip Schnabel, the uh, director of the Solomon Center, who would also like to add his welcome remarks. Thank you all. Um, thanks, Raghu. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I would like to welcome you to NYU Stern as well. Uh, my name is Philip Schnabel, and I'm a professor of finance here at NYU Stern. I'm director of the NYU Stern Solomon Center of Financial Institutions. Uh, let me just say that we are proud to be one of the co-organizers of today's event. Um, I just want to introduce you to the Solomon Center if you're not familiar with it uh, yet. Uh, let me just give you a brief overview of what we are about. The Solomon Center uh, was founded here at NYU Stern 50 years ago, uh, and its primary mission has always been uh, to bring together policymakers, practitioners, academics. Um, and today's conference is obviously a perfect fit for this uh, mission. Uh, let me emphasize this is not the only conference we are doing. Uh, in fact, we have a number of uh, events which are similar in nature. Uh, I'm sure some of you attended our conference on 10 years after the financial crisis uh, with a number of great speakers like Ben Benenke, Tim Geithner, Stan Fischer, uh, a number of Nobel laureates and many other great presenters. Uh, in case you missed it, uh, all the videos uh, and discussions are uh, online. Uh, another conference that is coming up is an academic conference that the Solomon Center is organizing jointly with the New York Fed. Uh, this will be after the summer break uh, and it's now in its 14th edition topic is research uh, in uh, the area of financial intermediation. I'm sure uh, the topic of uh, LIBOR and alternative reference rates uh, will come up there as well. Uh, let me emphasize that most of our events are open to the public, and in case you're interested, please um, just visit our website. You will find all the information there. You can register there um, as well. That said, if uh, anybody here in the room wants more collaboration with the university uh, and NYU Stern, uh, maybe you think there's a topic that could benefit from academic input, uh, maybe you have some great data and need a smart faculty member or a PhD student to analyze it. Uh, actually, we are, we are actively looking for deposit pricing data if anybody's interested. Uh, maybe there's something else that comes to mind. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me. You can just send me an email uh, or talk to me during a break really see ourselves as a platform for creating and promoting top academic research. And our center is always open for new ideas uh, and collaborations. Uh, so now getting back to today's event, I want to wish you a successful conference. And I will hand it over to uh, Randy, uh, who has some pre-recorded remarks. Um, my name is David Bowman. I'm a senior associate director at the Federal Reserve. Vice Chairman Quarles is the principal at the Fed that I report to most directly. Um, pretty busy guy. He's also a chair of the FSB. Uh, he sends his apologies for not being able to be here today, um, but he has taped some remarks and will now hear them. Good morning to you all. Uh, I'm sorry I can't be at the ARC's fourth roundtable, 
But I wanted to share these remarks with you at the start of what is the next critical stage in the transition away from LIBOR. Since 2014, the official sector has publicly warned that LIBOR could become unstable. Not everyone paid attention to those warnings, but the risks that we have pointed to have materialized. The UK Financial Conduct Authority has intervened to preserve LIBOR's stability only through the end of 2021. Despite that, some continue to speculate that LIBOR can remain in production indefinitely. My key message to you today is that you should take the warning seriously. Clarity on the exact timing and nature of the LIBOR stop is still to come, but the regulator of LIBOR has said that it's a matter of how LIBOR will end rather than if it will end, and it's hard to see how one could be clearer than that. The Federal Reserve convened the ARC based on our concerns about the stability of LIBOR. The ARC was charged with providing the market with the tools that would be needed for a transition from LIBOR, an alternative rate that didn't share the same structural instabilities that have led LIBOR to this point, a plan to develop liquidity in the derivatives market for this new rate so that cash users could hedge their interest rate risk, and models of better contract language that help to limit the risk from a LIBOR disruption. The ARC has provided these tools. Now it's up to you to begin using them. With only two and a half years of further guaranteed stability for LIBOR, the transition should begin happening in earnest. I believe that the ARC has chosen the most viable path forward and that most will benefit from following it. But regardless of how you choose to transition, beginning that transition now would be consistent with prudent risk management and the duty that you owe to your shareholders and clients. The ARC's work began by focusing on creating a derivatives market for the Secured Overnight Financing Rate, or SOFR, its recommended alternative to US dollar LIBOR. Because end users require derivatives markets to hedge their cash exposures. CME Group, LCH, and ICE all now offer futures or swaps markets on SOFR, and participation in these markets is growing. As liquidity in these markets continues to develop, my hope is that many of you will avail yourselves of them to close out your LIBOR positions. In the meantime, it will be crucial in ensuring global financial stability that everyone participate in ISDA's consultations on better fallback language for LIBOR derivatives, and then sign the ISDA protocol so that those fallbacks apply to the legacy book of derivatives. Likewise, the ARC has now offered better fallback language for new issuance of cash products that refer to LIBOR. It seems clear that much of the contract language being used currently did not envisage and is not designed for a permanent end to LIBOR. The ARC's fallback recommendations represent a significant body of work on the part of a wide set of market participants and set out a robust and well-considered set of steps that expressly consider an end to LIBOR. I urge everyone to avail themselves of this work. It's again important for prudent risk management and your fiduciary responsibilities that you incorporate better fallback language. Issuers should demand it of themselves and investors should demand it of issuers. There is, however, also another and easier path, which is simply to stop using LIBOR. At this moment, many seem to take comfort in continuing to use LIBOR. It's familiar, it remains liquid, but history may not view that decision kindly. After LIBOR stops, it may be fairly difficult to explain, to those who may ask, exactly why it made sense to continue using a rate that you had been clearly informed had such significant risks attached to it. And make no mistake, as good as the fallback language may be, simply relying on fallback language to transition brings a number of operational risks and economic risks. Firms should be incorporating these factors into their projected cost of continuing to use LIBOR, and investors and borrowers should consider them when they're offered LIBOR instruments. If you do consider these factors, then I believe you'll see it's in your interest to move away from LIBOR. In convening the ARC, we've set a model of public-private sector cooperation in addressing a key financial stability risk. Ultimately, the private sector must drive this transition. These are private contracts and each of you must choose how you can best address this. But the public sector must help. At a recent roundtable on the LIBOR transition held by the Financial Stability Board, we heard calls from the private sector to provide greater clarity on regulatory and tax implications of the transition. 
and also calls for a more muscular regulatory approach. It's incumbent on the official sector to take these requests seriously, and we are. For example, the Federal Reserve is working with the CFTC and other U.S. prudential regulators to provide greater clarity on the treatment of margin requirements for legacy derivatives instruments. Agency staff are developing proposed changes to the margin rules for non-cleared swaps to ensure that changes to legacy swaps to incorporate a move away from LIBOR, including adherence to the ISDA protocol, would not affect the grandfathered status of these legacy swaps under the margin rules. This has been a key request of the ARC, and we'll look forward to public comment on the proposal. The Federal Reserve supervisory teams have already included a number of detailed questions about plans for the transition away from LIBOR in their monitoring discussions with large firms. The Federal Reserve will expect to see an appropriate level of preparedness at the banks we supervise, and that level must increase as the end of 2021 grows closer. Our supervisory approach will continue to be tailored to the size of the institution and the complexity of LIBOR exposure, but the largest firms should be prepared to see our expectations for them increase. As we consider the answers we've received from these firms, we'll assess how our supervisory expectations for them should evolve in the coming year. Let me address one additional point relating to our supervisory stress tests in an effort to provide further clarity. Some have recently claimed that the Federal Reserve's supervisory stress tests would penalize a bank that replaces LIBOR with SOFR in loan contracts by lowering projections of net interest income under stress. As can be seen in our recently published enhanced descriptions of the supervisory stress test models, the interest rate variables that drive projections of net interest income under stress are the yield on 10-year Treasury bonds, the yield on three-month Treasury bills, and the 10-year triple B corporate yield. That is, the supervisory projections of net interest income are primarily based on models that implicitly assume that other rates, such as LIBOR or SOFR, move passively with short-term treasury rates. Given these mechanics, choosing to lend at SOFR rather than LIBOR will not result in lower projections of net interest income under stress in the stress test calculations of the Federal Reserve. I hope I've been able to provide you some further clarity today. I'm sure that the rest of the roundtable will do so as well. I want to applaud the members of the ARC who are working hard to make sure that this threat to financial stability is avoided. Thank you. Okay, why don't we let a minute, if people want to come in and find seats, feel free to do that. I think there are seats. If you, if you see an open reserve seat, too, feel free to sit in that, wherever you can find. There's some up in the front. All right. Well... The ARC is a private sector-led group, but with sponsorship from the Fed Reserve and many of the U.S. agencies. We've been very lucky um, to have a great set of leaders from the private sector. Many people have worked very hard for the industry good. We were unlucky in that um, the ARC's uh, uh, leadership changed, so Sandy O'Connor um, chose to have uh, uh, well-deserved uh, retirement, and I think she's probably working in her garden right now. Um, but we were extraordinarily lucky at the same time to have someone who could step in so ably to that role, uh, Tom Whiff, the new chair of the ARC. Tom has been with this process from the beginning, um, and the ARC and um, the U.S. economy uh, will profit from his leadership. He's going to say a few words.
Thank you very much, David. I think we've, uh, having just heard from uh, Vice Chairman Quarles, uh, that the official sector believes a transition is necessary. Indeed, they believe it is inevitable. Uh, in my experience, it's important to know uh, when to listen and who to listen to. Uh, the message from the official sector has been crystal clear. Responsible risk management begins with the assumption that a cessation of LIBOR uh, is a when, not if proposition, and when, as we know, maybe as soon as December 31st, 2021. LIBOR, based on its design and its history, is no longer fit for purpose. We have many people out there, in many ways, dealing with hypotheticals, trying to uh, share certain views about the transition uh, that LIBOR can or will continue, for example, but it's hard to see how they can have you know, better information than we've heard here today uh, than the people who regulate LIBOR and the banks that continue to submit to it. We see these as distractions from the work at hand. The official sector is sending a message, uh, and we think the entire industry should be listening and acting. Andrew Bailey has told us that the UK Financial Conduct Authority has essentially been holding LIBOR together for some time, first by encouraging banks to remain on the panels behind the scenes, and then when that began not to work, by securing a public agreement with the remaining banks to continue through the end of 2021. The Federal Reserve convened the ARC to help coordinate a transition away from LIBOR to a more robust rate, and the U.S. official sector has supported the ARC's work uh, as ex officio members. We've been given time, we've been given resources, and it's up to us not to squander either. Uh, as you heard, ARC uh, 1.0 was charged with two questions. Choose a new reference rate uh, that would comply with the IOSCO principles and create a plan uh, to promote the chosen rate in the derivatives markets. We focused on the derivatives markets initially because it represented 95% of the risk uh, around LIBOR because cash markets uh, needed a liquid alternative if they were to hedge their risks. As part of this mandate, the R created the PACE transition plan, which laid out a clear set of steps and timelines. You can see in the first slide, in the first year of SOFR's production, uh, we outperformed on each of the initial steps. Futures markets began just a month after SOFR was created, with both CME and ICE now offering SOFR futures, and clearing SOFR swaps began two months after that. The start of the futures and swaps markets have allowed participants to gain some confidence uh, in how these markets behave. With that confidence, the CCPs uh, have begun to explore variants that will speed up the next steps of the plan. CME jumped immediately to using SOFR PAI and discounting on cleared SOFR instruments instead of first offering a dual rate choice between SOFR and the federal funds rate uh, environments as envisioned in step four of the original plan. Now, LCH has announced that it intends to jump to a big bang uh, rather than offering this kind of dual rate environment on all cleared derivatives, and CME has expressed interest in taking the same kind of step. The critical steps will introduce a significant amount of hedging demand into the system and should provide a material boost to liquidity. The financial press hasn't picked up on this until quite recently, but I assure you it's a very big deal uh, and would come at least six months ahead of our original schedule on the ARC. A big bang will move price alignment interest and discounting on both new and legacy clear trades from the effective federal funds rate to SOFR in one step. And that's a substantial commitment to SOFR that will cause hedging demand for SOFR derivatives to increase even more. Step six of the PACE transition plan is the one that most people care about. So where does that leave us on the forward-looking term rate? Hopefully, the Big Bang will allow us to pull the timing of the production of a robust, IOSCO-compliant, forward-looking term rate ahead. But at this stage, we still are not in a position to say by how much or to provide any guarantees. The ARC's message on this has to be clear. The forward-looking term rate has to be robust and based on a deep market before it can be endorsed by the ARC. What's happening with LIBOR should teach us all that we've had enough of weak rates. And while it can be a useful tool for some, those who are able to use SOFR should not wait for the term rate in order to transition. The short answer is that a reliable term rate is completely dependent on the meaningful transition of underlying activity to SOFR. The ARC sees some specific uses where the term rates can be most productively used, in particular as a fallback for legacy cash products, and in loans where the borrowers otherwise have difficulty in adapting to the new environment. For many other purposes and products, the ARC believes it should be possible to use compound or simple averages of SOFR. The planned introduction of averages of SOFR to be published by the New York Fed in the first half of next year will provide an additional useful tool for those who face operational challenges to a daily calculation. In tandem with SOFR, it will create opportunities for a quicker transition. 
Market participants should not wait on the sidelines for a forward-looking term SOFR to be published before beginning their respective transitions in earnest. All the positive developments in the past year have shown us that SOFR has real use cases today. ARC 2.0, uh, as you heard, was created after Andrew Bailey's 2017 speech when many market participants became acutely aware that they could no longer ignore the warnings about LIBOR. The ARC has spent an enormous amount of time over the last year building tools that people can use to help them transition cash products. The next slide lays out what ARC has, has, has and will be working on this year, filling in some of the details of work which will happen leading up to the CCP Big Bang. We have set out six primary objectives for this year. First, we will continue to encourage the development of SOFR derivatives in, and cash markets. Almost all of the ARC working groups are involved in this. And although we can't promise an IOSCO compliant term rate for some time to come, in the interim, those market participants who may have difficulty using SOFR directly can at least begin to get a feel how the term rates will eventually look and behave by monitoring the indicative term rate data that two Federal Reserve economists have produced. They have also produced indicative compound averages of SOFR itself, which can help to anticipate the kind of averages of SOFR that the Federal Reserve Bank of New York says it intends to produce next year. The ARC has also just launched an infrastructure and operations working group, which will hold a roundtable with vendors across all markets at the end of June. Recognizing that a number of infrastructures will need to be developed in order to allow a move away from LIBOR. In the cash markets, we have already seen many ARC members and also some non-ARC members issue substantial amount of SOFR debt. The ARC's floating rate notes group is examining market, market conventions that can help ease issuance of SOFR-based debt for those that want to participate in this market. ARC members continue to innovate in this market, for example, recently branching out to issue based on a compounded average of SOFR. Issuance of SOFR floating rate debt needs to continue, and the ARC has pledged to encourage the launch of securitization and loans. We've already seen our first SOFR-based securitization uh, in a REMIC issued by Ginnie Mae, and the Business Loans Working Group is looking to, into operational changes that would be needed to issue loans based on SOFR. The ARC recently issued a user's guide to SOFR, which we'll hear a lot more about today, to teach about how they can handle some of these operational changes. The progress clearly indicates that debt issuers recognize that the best way out of a hole is to stop digging it. And it's important to reduce LIBOR exposure by using SOFR when and where we can as soon as possible. The PACE transition plan is the primary construct aimed at creating a baseline level of liquidity in SOFR derivatives, but the ARC has also taken other steps to promote these markets. Members of the ARC's market structures group have worked with other national working groups on a document that will be used to consult on the structure of the cross-currency swap market using risk-free rates like SOFR. As you know, a lot of corporates depend on the cross-currency swap market. We've already seen one SOFR cross-currency swap trade in the market. It is key that this market fully develops. The Market Structures Working Group is also discussed auction-like compression mechanisms that could allow people to move their swaps from LIBOR to SOFR in a much more efficient manner. We'll also hear about the ARC's work on fallback language today. This represents a major body of work, and I'm pleased to say today that we have completed our recommendations for fallbacks to be used in floating rate debt, syndicated and bilateral loans, and securitization. So the work of the ARC on cash products and fallbacks is now in the rearview mirror and available to the market. This was a huge push uh, for the ARC over the last year, and we will have some further work to do over the rest of this year uh, as we move forward. The fallback language that we have relies on a spread adjustment recommended by the ARC, and we will examine and consult on the potential adjustment methodologies, being very sure to stay close, to keep close track of ISDA's work on derivatives. Market participants can already use the ARC recommended language now, and by the end of this year, ISDA expects to offer its definition amendments and protocol for use in the derivatives markets. It is important that mar market participants use better fallback language if they are going to keep using LIBOR. But fallbacks are best described as seatbelts. The best way to eliminate risk is to voluntarily convert or close out uh, existing LIBOR positions in advance of 2021. The ARC's regulatory issues and accounting and tax working groups have requested relief to make sure that no one is penalized either for signing the ISDA protocol or for closing out from LIBOR, and I encourage people to do both. 
Market participants will, however, have to consider that although new fallbacks provide meaningful risk reduction and are light years better than the legacy language, they do not fully immunize all potential value transfer. They provide a huge first step in reducing risk to cessation and should be taken up in earnest ASAP. But this year, with a clear line of sight to a post-2021 world, the outcomes across cash and derivatives, risk managers will really need to determine exactly how much risk and how many fallbacks they are willing to take over the December 2021 cliff. The modeling changes alone could serve as a catalyst for conversion and closeouts clearly being the better uh, risk reduction alternative. Of course, some legacy cash products will not be able to be amended to incorporate better fallback language or to be extinguished altogether. The ARC will look to minimize the impacts uh, of the transition to SOFR where we can, but market participants need to be aware that there are risks that the ARC cannot guarantee a solution uh, and we can't guarantee a solution for every problem. There may be no solution for some of these products. However, as noted in the ARC's minutes, we are discussing whether it would make sense to pursue some form of legislative relief in New York and perhaps in other states. This is generating obviously a fair amount of interest, uh, but the analysis is in its very, very early stages and it is not yet ready for prime time. We need to be sure that the legal arguments are fully considered before deciding whether to take any steps and of course, it will be up to the legislative process to decide whether uh, any requests are taken up. We are hoping to decide if seeking legislative relief is the right way to go over the next several months at the ARC. On consumer products, from the start, the ARC has recognized that consumer products need to be treated with the highest standards of care uh, and needed to move on a separate track. We started up our consumer products group in its earnest at the start of this year. And by using many of the lessons learned in the other working groups, they have been able to make really good progress. We'll talk a bit more about consumer products in the last panel today, but the group is working to both release a white paper on potential models of adjustable rate mortgages using SOFR and a consultation on better fallback language in mortgages referencing LIBOR. Throughout this process, the CFPB, FHFA, Federal Reserve, and other ex officio members have been actively engaged, uh, as have consumer groups. The ARC is committed to making sure that our proposals work for consumers while also recognizing that they need to work for investors if consumers are to be able to borrow at competitive rates. Outreach and coordination. Finally, but not least, we will continue to do all we can to reach out and educate and listen to all sectors of the market and we will continue to engage with the counterparts of the ARC in other jurisdictions. The user's guide, the fallback language, our roundtables, our office hours, the many events that ARC members are attending on a near weekly basis to discuss the transition are some of the ways that we are conducting outreach. I hope that we can continue to expand these efforts uh, this year and to incorporate an even wider audience. I've been involved in the public facing side of the industry for many years with the Treasury Market Practices Group for over a decade and most recently with the CFTC's Market Risk Advisory Council and as a board member of ISDA. But I've never seen anything like the scale and of the transition from LIBOR. The ARC now has 12 different working groups with 100 institutions engaged and 800 people involved in at least one of these working groups. This is an unprecedented risk management undertaking and the ARC is aware of that. The ARC is now moving to a new implementation phase when we should all be using the tools that have been provided. 2019 is absolutely a mission critical year and with only two and a half years left on the clock, we should all consider the challenges and act now. We should all be listening to the message from the official sector that the transition will happen. We have also heard the message today that the official sector stands ready to support us. There are already many ways that they provided support. But while the official sector can support this transition, they've also made it clear that this is voluntary and they are not seeking to oppose a solution on the market. The industry has been presented with a one-time opportunity to address this financial stability issue, utilizing all the subject matter expertise in the market today. A broad-based industry solution will provide the best outcome with the least amount of disruption. Experience tells me that the alternative will be more prescriptive and a lot less flexible. So the progress we make over the next 12 months is critical to preserving an industry-designed outcome to this issue. 
these are our contracts, our markets, our pricing, our risks, and our problem. It's up to us to take the lead on the solution. The ARC has provided the tools. The industry needs to do the work. The clock is ticking, and the time is now. Thank you very much. I'll pass it back to David. Okay, uh, hopefully you've heard the message that uh, people do at this stage need to begin thinking about maybe kind of transitioning away from LIBOR, um, maybe even more than that. Uh, I'm going to try to convince you today that um, at least part of that transition um, uh, should involve SOFR. This is up to you. The ARC's work is voluntary. I'm going to try, try to make the case to you that you will find it in your interest um, to make at least so make so for at least part of your transition plan, and that you can do that. You can begin using SOFR now. It will take a little bit of change in what you do, but in some, way, some ways, not very much. So I'm going to try to tell you how you can use SOFR. Okay, so first, why would you ever want to use SOFR? Well, again, this is in the context where you've been told that it's a matter of when and how LIBOR stops. So I assume that most of you, if LIBOR is going to chug away, you would just keep using it happily. But you're not in that place, so you're going to have to do something. Why might you want to uh, make SOFR part of that? There's a lot of things about SOFR that were extraordinarily hard to create. And there's a lot of good reasons as to why you ought to use it. So among the pluses um, are it's a rate produced by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York for the public good. It is not for profit. Um, it is for the public good. It's derived from an active, well-defined market with sufficient depth to make it externally difficult to ever manipulate or influence. And you can see that here. The SOFR market is based on the overnight treasury repo market. That is the black bar. That is the largest market in a single maturity rates market in the world. But when we started this, it was averaging about $750 billion a day. Actually, now the averages are you know, over $900 billion a day. Other rates, you know, especially term rates uh, like LIBOR, are based on markets to the far right. It is extraordinarily difficult to create any kind of transaction-based rate um, that is robust, cannot be manipulated, is transparent, based on markets that are that thin. With SOFR, you just don't have those problems. SOFR is produced in a transparent, direct manner, and it's based on observable transactions, rather than being dependent on estimates or models like LIBOR. Last thing is, um, it is derived from a market that was able to weather the global financial crisis, um, and that the ARC credibly believes will remain active enough in order that it can be reliably produced in a wide range of market conditions. So even during the financial crisis, right, the treasury repo market was one of the few that survived. In fact, volumes actually grew during the crisis. Uh, most of the rates could not say that. Uh, so if you want a rate that's going to be there when you need it, SOFR will be. If you're trying to base a rate based on rates like LIBOR, it's not clear that it will. Um, there are very few transactions, I believe, underlying the LIBOR market during the financial crisis it's not clear to me exactly how I would produce a transaction-based rate at times like that. With SOFR, you don't have to worry about that. We will be there when you need it, um, which is a pretty good thing in a reference rate. The last thing to say about why you should consider it is it's got a lot of advantages that were very hard to create and will be very difficult for any other rate to try to create. We've already heard about the PACE transition plan, right? SOFR futures are already um, well beyond their start. They have farther to go, but um, they are credibly established. Most other markets that people try to create, futures markets or swap markets, fail, right? The SOFR market will not fail. SOFR is also already has FASB hedge accounting status, which I you know, believe I've been told is important for many of the people in this room. Um, you know, the other rates out there, um, I don't believe ever will have FASB hedge accounting status. So we've done something that it is really hard to do. Um, 
and anyone else trying to offer you other solutions, I think we'll have a very hard time trying to recreate what we've done with SOFR. However, you know, despite all these good things, it is the case, SOFR is new, it is different from LIBOR, and you will have to learn how to use it. I can't do that step for you. I can try to talk to you about how you can use it, but you'll have to do the learning. Okay, so we're gonna have a little bit of primer on SOFR. Um, I always get the wonky parts of everything, so this is the wonky part of this, this round table. Again, SOFR is based off overnight treasury repo transactions. There are many different segments of this market. There's tri-party, there's bilateral. SOFR is based on the widest available data we have. It's the widest coverage of any repo rate in the U.S. ever produced. As I said, it's produced by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Um, they publish it around 8 a.m. every day. You can go and find it on their website. You can see this is a screen grab of their website. The rate that Firbney produces every day are based on transactions that they receive overnight from the previous day. So, um, for instance, uh, on April 16th, they published a rate based on transactions that were entered into on April 15th. People decide, you know, what rate they want to borrow at on April 15th. We get the transactions. We publish the rate on April 16th, which is the day that the money is returned to you. So there's one day lag. That's different from LIBOR, um, where, you know, it's published 11 a.m. Uh, London time on the day. This is published with a one day lag. That is different, but it is exactly the same way that we produce the Fed funds effective and that other jurisdictions produce their risk-free rates. So it's different, but it's not particularly new, um, and it is entirely workable. All right, now the second thing you might want to know is, well, where do I get data? Um, as I said, you can go to the Federal Reserve Bank of New York's website, you can get data. Um, so for began production, uh, April 3rd of last year, on their website, um, the first one you go to, you can find historical data going back to that time. But they've also published data, um, uh, pre-production data, based on uh, uh, estimates they have of data they collected before the official publication of SOFR. And they've published that, and, I've, uh, and that goes back to 2014. I've got a link to that there. In addition, um, about a year and a half ago, um, they published another source of repo data, which is based on um, primary dealer surveys that they conduct every day. Uh, and that historical data, which is not exactly the same as SOFR, um, there are certain technical differences from SOFR, but that data goes back to 1998. Now I'm gonna, um, I'm in the act of publishing a Fed's note that argues um, that I think this is um, good historical data, that you can use this to um, adequately risk model SOFR. And the basic argument in that note is, you know, before the Dodd-Frank regulations, so before 2014, the repo market was fairly homogeneous, and different segments of it move really closely together. Um, and therefore, you know, in what I can see, this historical data going back to 1998 seems like a good proxy for how a rate like SOFR would have behaved. Now, what does that data tell you? Um, here, I'm showing three much averages of this repo rate and three much averages of the Fed funds effective. Now, as you can see, um, the repo rate is really quite close to the Fed funds effective on average over a wide variety of circumstances. So on any given day, there's going to be some volatility in SOFR. If you look at the daily history during the financial crisis, you'll see a few days of some extreme volatility where, where the repo rate spikes down. Those are the worst days of financial crisis where people would basically, you know, kill their grandmothers to get treasury collateral. So the rates really fell on those days. Um, but then they bounce back. And, you know, if you do a three-month average, you can't really see those bounces at all. So how should you expect SOFR to behave? You should expect it to behave pretty much like the Fed funds effective on average, which means moving fairly closely with the center of the Fed's monetary target, right? So you can risk model SOFR, I believe. All right. So we gave you a rate. There's history. How can you use that in financial markets? 
There's a couple different ways that you can use it. First, you know, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York has indicated plans to publish averages of SOFR um, in the first half of next year. Market participants are already using averages of SOFR in floating rate debt that we've seen issued, in um, SOFR futures, and SOFR swaps. So taking an average is pretty easy. You can do that in Excel. You can use SOFR that way. The fact that the Federal Reserve Bank of New York will um, publish the rate, I think, will help gain familiarity. But you don't need to wait for them to publish it. You can just calculate uh, that average yourself. And that's what the debt and futures and swaps markets do. Now, as Thomas said, and I know there's a lot of interest in this, the ARC has also set a goal of seeing forward-looking term rates based off SOFR derivatives produced as the last step of its pace transition plan. Though that may not come till the end of 2021. <coughs> as Tom also said, Fed Reserve staff members have produced indicative forward-looking term rates. So indicative here means um, they're not IOSCO compliant, they're not meant to be used in contracts, they're just for your information. Um, and why they published them was, you know, proof of concept. Um, and because I think the ARC believes that seeing this kind of data can help you grow familiar um, with how a rate like the term rates will behave <coughs> and, you know, give you some hope or confidence that those rates eventually can be produced. The data, um, I show part of that data um, on the top slide here. Uh, again, the blue line is this three month indicative so for forward looking term rate. You can find this data, if you go to the ARCS website, you look to the right, you do one click, you'll go to the, um, f the f two staff members' Fed's paper, you do another click and you'll get to the data. So there's two clicks, um, but you can find the data. And it's regularly updated. It's not daily, but they update it regularly. So how should the term rate behave once you know, it is able to be commercially published? It should behave pretty much like a, a, you know, a one month or a three month Fed funds OIS contract. And you can see that here. Um, it's very smooth, uh, and it moves pretty much in line with Fed Funds OIS. So you already have some familiarity with how the term rate will behave if you have any familiarity with how you know, Fed Funds OIS behave. Um, that forward-looking term rate also is going to be really tightly aligned, um, almost always, with averages of SOFR. Right? So this is a matter of some confusion. What's the relationship between the term rate and the kind of compound averages of SOFR um, that are used in, um, the floating, as a floating leg in the swaps market? There's a very tight alignment between those two. And you can see that here, while well, you can see what in the bottom panel, there's a very tight alignment between uh, Fed funds OIS and the compound average of the Fed funds in arrears. Right? Um, so, uh, the only real difference is that the term rate is the expectation about what's going to happen, and the compound average is what really actually happens, more or less. There's the term premiums and stuff like that. But um, uh, in some ways, well, in many ways, I think the average of SOFR, that compound average, is the gold standard. If you want to hedge actual interest rate risk, use the compound average, because that will reflect what actually happens to interest rates over the period. The term rate is convenient in some ways, but it's just the market's guess about what's going to happen. Um, you know, the compound average will give you what actually happens. Okay, now, I know lots of people just want to wait for the term rate, so I'm going to try to convince you not to do that. Okay. So I've got two slides on this, because I really want to try to convince you of this. Why should you not just wait for the term rate? Right? Well, the forward-looking term rates um, will have to be based off SOFR derivatives markets, so SOFR futures, SOFR swaps. If you looked at that slide that I showed you before with the big bar for SOFR, there is no cash market. There's no term cash market with enough depth to produce a robust term rate. Right? So um, we can't give you a term rate now. The only market that will conceivably have enough depth are SOFR futures, SOFR swaps. Now, SOFR futures um, are growing at a very fast pace. I'm very pleased with um, the progress there. And I want to thank CME and ICE um, uh, for helping to create these markets. 
it is, it's growing at the third fastest pace of any offering, uh, any futures offering I think they've had. It's growing faster than Fed funds futures or Euro dollar futures did at this stage in their development. So we can all be pleased about that. And the swaps market is coming along um, uh, behind that. However, at the same time that all those things are true, and you can see that growth in uh, futures and CME futures in uh, the chart to the right, at the same time all that is absolutely true, it is still the case that the volume underlying sulfur futures are a fraction of the volumes underlying Fed funds futures or euro dollar futures, right? So the markets are not at a depth at which you can create a robust term rate today. I have every confidence that someday they will be. I cannot give you a firm date for that. Hopefully it will become before LIBOR ends rather than after LIBOR ends. But what I can tell you is it's not today and it's not gonna be tomorrow either. It's gonna be some time before the robust IASCO compliant term rate can be built. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is um, uh, that the only way we're going to get a robust IOSCO compliant term rate is if most products actually try to use SOFR directly. And this is a point um, that Tom makes quite a bit. With LIBOR, we have the following really bad situation. We have $200 trillion of U.S. Con dollar contracts, contracts referencing U.S. dollar LIBOR, 200 trillion, it's 10 times U.S. GDP, built off a very, very tiny, thin, uh, not very relevant anymore market that has about 500 million underneath it. So there's a pyramid, but the pyramid is inverted. It's not stable. It shouldn't be surprising that, you know, we're in the process of seeing that thing crash over. What the ARC would like to do instead is build a pyramid. I know this sounds crazy, but maybe the right side up this time. Right? So that's actually stable. For that to be stable, you need to have SOFR right, at the bottom, which we do. SOFR cash products, SOFR derivatives built on top of that. And then the term rate, term rate cash products, and maybe some term rate derivatives on top of that. That will be the only structure that really is stable. Trying to base all derivatives or all cash products on the term rate just inverts the pyramid again, you're gonna crash again, and you should not want to do that, right? So for that reason, the ARC believes, and has been tried to be clear, um, that although the term rate can be useful for certain um, products, particularly in the loan market for people who can't move, um, and for fallbacks, most cash products um, and most users should try to use SOFR, <coughs> all right? So here we have a couple reasons about uh, why you shouldn't just wait for the term rate. One is we don't know that we can get it to you in time. You know, one consulting firm had this timeline, and one of the recommendations was, you know, produce the term rate earlier. And then they, they kind of mapped that out. But, um, you know, in that plan, you would need that term rate to come, like, next month or, you know, three months from now. Um, if you're just going to base your strategy, your transition strategy, entirely on that term rate, it's not going to come a month or three months from now. You know, maybe it will come in earlier in 2021, but it's not coming anytime soon. So waiting for it is a really bad transition strategy. And what are some other reasons not to wait for it? First of all, um, I'll use this joke one more time. Um, when I started this, I got reminded of the Princess Bride, you know, where the um, swordsman always says, uh, no, where the, um, the really supposedly smart guy keeps saying, inconceivable, right? It's inconceivable that this happens, and then the thing happens, whatever it is. You know, it's inconceivable that someone could scale the cliff, and then he scales the cliff, right? And so at one point, someone turns to him, the swordsman turns to him and says, I don't think that word means what you think it means, <laughs> right? <laughs> And I swear to you, you know, before the first super issuance of floating rate debt, I had people saying, it is impossible. David, you do not understand the market. It is impossible for floating rate debt to reference SOFR. And then, you know, someone does it and they go, oh, you know, I guess we could do it, right? <laughs> um, so a lot of things that you think are impossible, they're not. <laughs> they're, in fact, totally possible. Um, so we've seen that already. The floating rate debt market in the States has proven that you can use simple or compound averages of SOFR. And yeah, you got to rejiggle your systems a little. It didn't do it, you know, they had to figure a few things out. Took them a couple weeks, but they could do it. Um, yeah, some of the people issuing 
um, tell me that in general they get better price. They think they get better pricing um, issuing off SOFR than they do LIBOR. So it's not even like you have to pay a penalty. Um, and I've seen some of um, the take-up sheets, and it was pretty wide. I was impressed, right? So there is a market out there. I mean, why would there not be? Why? If all you're doing is offering people the chance to buy LIBOR, like how exciting a uh, offering can that really be um, when LIBOR is very likely to stop? There are people out there who will buy SOFR products if you are willing to offer that to them. Second reason not to wait for the term rate. If you're seeking to hedge your position, so you're issuing floating rate debt that you want to hedge, um, or a loan that you want to hedge, or securitization, it's going to be way easier to hedge. It's going to be easier and cheaper for you to just issue off SOFR itself and then hedge in the SOFR future SOFR swaps market. It's more complicated. It's probably going to be more expensive to issue in the term rate market and then try to use the SOFR market to hedge the term rate risk, right? If you just want to hedge, there's no, you don't need the term rate, right? Issue SOFR, hedge, you're done. It's super easy and it will be cheaper for you. Third reason, you know, as I've stated, using averages of SOFR in arrears, which we'll get to, is actually the baseline hedge for interest rate risk. The term rate, though you're used to forward-looking term rates, they're just your guess about what's going to happen to rates. Sometimes you are wrong. Um, you forget this, but sometimes you are wrong. But the averages of SOFR, they'll hedge what actually happens to interest rate risk. It is a better hedge. Lastly, um, there are structures, such as loans based on overnight LIBOR, that can be readily adapted to SOFR, right? So I can think of at least three ways that you can use SOFR pretty darn quickly right now, and I'm going to go through them. But, you know, in some of them, I think a lot of people are saying, well, I'm going to have to build systems, I'm going to have to change systems, I'm going to get, have to get vendors to change systems. There are structures that you could use right now. If you're a firm that can do an overnight LIBOR loan, you can, you know, you can fix that up in a few weeks to do an overnight SOFR loan. Might be based off simple interest rather than compound interest, but you could use it. You could do that. Um, that's readily available to you. So, um, and that's important because um, it's two and a half years. This is massive, right? I think a lot of people aren't even taking on board how massive this will be. Even if you get a plan, which I hope you do, um, just enacting that plan is going to take a lot of time. Trying to start all this now makes way more sense than trying to wait. All right. So, all right. I've hopefully convinced you that maybe you ought not to. Well, I'll go on a few more. Um, <laughs> I think this is important, right? Um, I'm, I've never asked anybody just, you know, move your entire book from Library to Suffer today. That would not be prudent, right? All I'm asking people is give it a chance, dip your toe in the water, try a little bit. Now, why is that in your interest, right? If you get started early, one, you're going to have a much easier time on the day that LIBOR stops. If your entire strategy is just wait till it stops and then see what happens, maybe rely on fallback language, that's a pretty complicated day for you. Do you know how many phone calls and how many systems you're going to have to be checking you know, that haven't broken, right? How many customer calls are going to be coming in saying, you know, what, what is my rate now? What is my rate now? How many things are going to have to go right and how many things are probably actually going to go wrong on that day if you put all your risk on just hitting the wall and, you know, you know transitioning on the day LIBOR stops? That's like several different Y2Ks you know, stuffed together with a bunch of other really bad stuff. It will be a bad day for you. On the other hand, if you move early, right, you could have a pretty good day. Your boss might even come in and say, you are really smart, right? <laughs> you could look around at those customers somewhere else, right, who are calling, trying to get a hold of their firm that did not transition, and you could maybe, uh, you know, suggest having lunch with a few of them, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, you will have capital um, that you can deploy, right? The other thing is that some of your customers might actually want to be offered a SOFR product. They might appreciate the chance to um, begin to dip their toes in the water and to begin to move early. You may have a competitive advantage over a firm that doesn't offer SOFR. And again, this is all voluntary. You can do what you want. But you know, a refusal to offer any SOFR product at all 
That's just saying sulfur's not even going to be in the mix at all. I, that's a pretty strong statement. I don't see how that's possibly true, right? So if you think that there's some clients out there that might want sulfur, maybe you want to offer them some other rate too, but maybe there's some that want sulfur. Maybe they'll pay you a good rate for it. Maybe it's good for you competitively. And why would you not want to try that out? Why would you not want to experiment and see what happens? Okay, so now I've maybe convinced you to try to use sulfur. How would you do that? Um, I assume most of you know this, but it is a point of confusion. Almost all financial contracts that use an overnight rate use an average of the overnight rate. They don't use a single day's value. There's a few swaps that are based on a single day, what's going to happen on a quarter end, but everything basically uses averages. So for futures, use averages of SOFR. Fed funds futures use averages of Fed funds. SOFR swaps use averages of SOFR. Fed fund swaps use averages of Fed funds. The floating rate debt that's been issued uses um, uh, <coughs> averages of SOFR. So this would be one month or three months. Now on this page, you can see I've plotted all the risk-free rates in all the different jurisdictions. SOFR is the green line. Now, these are all market rates. They do show some volatility. Maybe not when they were at the zero lower bound, but it's normal for a market rate to show some volatility. SOFR is far from the outlier in that. There are some you know, pre-crisis that were far more volatile than SOFR. So you might look at that and you say, well, I can't use that rate. But and I will turn to you and say, but you're not. The floating rate is an average of these rates, and that is to the right. The averages are smooth. The averages are perfectly usable. Um, the market knows this. The market has done this for a long time, derivatives markets. This is a problem that has an easy solution. The solution is already there. Just use averages. Now people say, yeah, but I read newspaper articles, so for jumped up, you know, at the year end. And someone told me that it, therefore it can't be used. The year end jumps, the quarter end jumps, those are things that happen in markets. Um, Fed funds used to spike down um, at year and quarter ends. LIBOR would uh, move up appreciably around year and quarter ends during the financial crisis. It's not anything new. It was certainly something the ARC was aware of. Again, um, if you use averages, well, and you can see the spike in uh, SOFR at the top, the black line, that's the daily rate. There was a big spike at the year end um, this year. Wasn't unprecedented, but was bigger than the past couple of years. But again, uh, the blue line is a one-month average of SOFR. The, three, uh, the green line is a three-month average of SOFR. You cannot see the year end. I can't see it, at least in the green line, right? I mean, I know where the year end is. I'm showing you where the year end is. But if I just look at the green line, I can't see it. So even, even you know, the year end that we saw, again, has no really real appreciable impact on the average of SOFR. Um, and it remains the case that a three-month average of SOFR is less volatile than three-month LIBOR. Three-month LIBOR has had some swings, some 40 to, 50, 40 to 60 basis point swings over the past couple of years relative to OIS. Those have been real swings, right? Those are, those are swings that have impacted what people pay on their loans or on their mortgages, right? You don't see those kinds of swings in a three-month average of SOFR. <coughs> Uh, now, you know, I explain this to people, I've explained it to the press, you don't see it in the averages, and they don't always get it. I think one of the benefits of having the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, you know, move to publish averages of SOFR is it will be clear, right? Then you can point and just say, yeah, that's the overnight rate, but my floating rate is really an average, and you can see that that thing didn't move, right? So part of this will just help people understand that the averages are far smoother, um, and that's what the floating rate really is. Okay, now we get to the more wonky part. Um, hopefully I've convinced you you want to use an average. What many, of the, many people in the industry and the ARC working groups are struggling with is what kind of average. It turns out there's a couple different kinds of averages. One is a simple average, which is the kind that you learned in, I don't know, fifth grade? Whenever you learn it, right? One plus one, you, know, you just add them up and you divide. Um, the other is a compound average, which isn't a lot harder um, but maybe less familiar to, to you. Um, it's just multiplying some things together rather than adding them together. Now, a compound average um, reflects the economic value of money. So to an economist, if you were an economist, and I hope you're not, but if you were, the compound average would make sense, 
right? When I invest money in a money market mutual fund or even a bank, I get compound interest, right? And all that means is any interest I earn next day or next period, I earn, earn interest on that interest as well. It just accumulates up. That's all it means. Um, uh, so um, compound interest does make sense. I think many ARC members believe that they would like to see their firms um, move towards compound interest um, over the long term and are willing to you know, encourage vendors to help support that over time. But it is the case that many loan systems you know, were not built for compounding. I um, guess they were built a long time ago, um, haven't really taken up the computer revolution. They're based off of uh, simple averages. And that's, you know, that's legitimate. It's hard to change the systems. It's complicated, right? Um, so right now, a lot of systems might use simple. A lot of floating rate debt has used simple, although we've seen one recent compound issuance in floating rate debt markets that went pretty well. That's OK, right? These are just conventions. Um, in normal times, there's not going to be a ton of difference between a simple average and a compound average. If rates are really low, um, there's going to be hardly any difference. As rates rise, there will be some. It can go up to five basis points or so. It has historically. Um, so you'll see some movements between them. But those are movements you can correct for. So if you're offering a loan based off simple interest, you can just adjust your margin um, to get the same borrowing cost um, as you would have if you, if you issued compound. So I feel kind of agnostic between the two. You, know, you could choose either one of those. If simple interest is simpler, uh, and it is in the short run, do that, right? I think a lot of banks actually can offer a simple interest loan right now. You could do that. Um, and then finally, people will mix and match, too, to make it even more confusing. Like sometimes you'll compound the rate, but then you'll add the margin. And that will be really confusing to economists. You can freak us out when you tell us you're doing that. Um, but they're just conventions. And you can choose any of those conventions that you want. Choose the one that makes sense and is easiest. So um, that part's not a big deal, right? It sounds complicated. If you've never done compounding, you'll have to learn it. You won't like it. But um, you're smart, and you can do it. But they're just conventions. Choose one. And if you can do simple now, then do simple now. Lesson two is not really that much harder, um, but it's a little bit harder. There is an actual choice that needs to be made here. Um, the other choice you have to make if you're going to use an average of SOFR is you know, what period to take the average over. So uh, in the industry, there's two concepts here. There's one, and these will be on the, web, the website too, so you don't actually have to take pictures. Um, you can, but they, these should be posted on the ARCS website pretty darn soon. Um, uh, so there's two conventions. One is called in advance. That means you, know, you set the rate at the start of a coupon period or an interest period. Most LIBOR swaps are in advance. You use the, average, you use the reading of LIBOR at the start of the interest period. Now, that's nice, I guess, um, because you know what you're going to have to pay at the end, right? You know it three months in advance or a month in advance. Um, you may not need that long, but you know it. Um, the other concept is called in arrears. And uh, Fed Funds OIS, SOFR OIS, um, the floating rate debt that we've seen, all use an in arrears concept. That means that um, the rate is established at the end of the interest period, right? Um, uh, so there are some LIBOR swaps in arrears, but mostly in advance, but um, the overnight swap market um, uses, that there, yeah, the overnight swaps market uses, you know, entirely an in arrears framework. The nice thing about in arrears is that it's going to reflect what actually happens to rates over the period, right? So you get a perfect hedge of interest rate risk. The tension is that you're only going to know your payment if you're the one who has to pay a day or two days in advance of when payment is due. Some borrowers might need more time than that. They may not need three months' notice. They may not need even need a month's notice. but you know, many might need more than a day or two days notice. So that's the tension. Okay. So,
this part you're going to have to make a decision on. I can't decide for you. I think in the floating rate debt market we have seen, there are actually a lot of players out there who ha can handle in arrears. They can handle a couple days' notice of what's to be paid. But not everybody can. Um, and, you know, so for those, you might use in, in advance. You might set the rate at the beginning of the period based on some average of SOFR. What the lender might not like about that is that rate they can consider to be out of date. You know, that was the average over the last period. It's not hedging me against what's going to happen this period. So there's basis, right, if you use in advance. That is true. There will be some basis. But it's not really a new issue. So even if you use a forward-looking term rate like LIBOR, right, um, uh, you're going to have basis. That's because, right, so people don't like in advance because they say, well, what if the Fed, what if we all know the Fed's going to raise rates three months from now? That won't show up on a backward-looking average of SOFR, but it'll show up in LIBOR, you know, it'll show up in one-year LIBOR. Um, uh, and that's true if you expect it, it should show up on one-year LIBOR, but then you have to ask, how accurate are my guesses? You know, how good is one-year LIBOR at actually predicting what's going to happen to interest rates? So in the bottom left, that's what I do. I just plot one-year LIBOR. I mean adjust it to control for the credit spread and just ask how well did one-year LIBOR um, predict what was going to happen in, to Fed monetary policy over the year. And that is the orange line. All right, so they made some mistakes. How much did, just taking an average of SOFR in advance, just take the average at the beginning of the year, take it over one month, how'd that do? That's the blue line, right? Um, almost identically to one year LIBOR, right? So just because it's a forward looking rate doesn't mean you don't have basis, right? You only don't have basis if you're super good at predicting what's gonna happen to interest rates over the year. And a lot of times you aren't, right? So a lot of times, just taking a simple average is about as good a predictor about what's going to happen to interest rates as you know, one-year LIBOR is, right? So you have basis already. Um, you just tend not to recognize it because you're used to the framework. The other way to see this in the mortgage market, and this is the right line, in the mortgage market, that's based on one-year LIBOR again. What they do is they take a 30-day average of one-year LIBOR set 45 days before the first interest rate period right? First interest rate payment. That's how they um, establish what the floating rate is on a mortgage. So all I do in the right chart is just say, well, how, how far out of date do you get? You've taken your 30-day average 45 days in advance. How far out of date are you when the first interest payment at the new rate is due? You can be off by 200 basis points, right? Easily, right? Now, you don't recognize that because your systems are based on LIBOR, so you don't see the basis. But you have basis, you're just not recognizing it. So in advance, you will have some basis, but test out exactly how much basis you have. It turns out that a better predictor than either of these is just to do a reset every six months. If you just do take a one-month average of SOFR or Fed funds, but have a six-month reset rather than a year, you do better than one-year LIBOR in predicting what's actually going to happen. So you have basis. It's just a different kind of basis. Don't let your native prejudices, like I'm used to forward-looking term rates, so anything different must be bad, um, sway you. Do the math. Figure out how bad it is. Um, here I'm trying to do this. So here I'm looking at different resets. You know, what would be the basis between a five-year loan with a floating rate set in advance based on uh, with monthly resets? versus in arrears, or with three-month resets, or six-month resets. If you're going to have a one-month reset, your basis is very small. First of all, on average, it's zero. I mean, the worst it ever got over history was, you know, a couple basis points. More basis, you know, less basis than you're maybe facing by doing simple rather than compounding, right? So you can handle that basis, right? Um, so if another way that you could use uh, SOFR in a loan is just make it be a monthly reset. There'll be some basis, but there's not going to be very much basis, and you can certainly handle that. You can certainly hedge that, right? So test out your assumptions. Okay. 
Now, there's lots of different ways that you can ha kind of handle this tension of, um, I'd like to be in arrears, right? Because I'd like to hedge my interest rate risk, but I want to give my borrower notice, enough notice about what payment they have to make. So the industry has come up with a bunch of different ways to do that. Um, using in advance first, you can just base, you know, if you've got a three-month loan based off SOFR in advance, you could maybe use a three-month average of SOFR, or you could use an average of SOFR over the last month just before the reset. You could do either of those things. Um, one of those I'm going to call just last reset, reset, and the other is last recent. Right? So you have some choices even if you're making an in advance structure. In arrears, you're going to have lots of choices. Um, you could have pure arrears, which is basically, you know, I'm going to tell you in the morning how much you owe, and I'm going to want you to pay at the end of the day. Not very much notice. You could have a payment delay, which is I'm going to tell you, you know, today what you owe, but I'm going to give you two days to pay it. That's what essentially they do in the derivatives market. You could have a lockout, which is two days before payment is due, I'm just going to freeze interest rates, right? So two days before your payment is due, we're going to know all the interest rates that are going to go into your payment. You can calculate your payment. Um, uh, and the other thing that you can do is called, and that's called a payment delay, uh, that's called a lockout. The other thing you can do is just use the look back. For every day, I'm going to look back two days and use that rate as my interest rate for today. All of the payment delay, the look back, the lockout are all just ways of giving the borrower more time to know what they have to pay. You can use any of them. There are also some uh, hybrid models, which I'm not sure anyone is ever going to do, but um, you could do them. Uh, and those basically eliminate any basis that you might be afraid of, while at the same time allowing your borrower ample advance notice. Um, uh, so in these, basically, you set the payment in advance, but then you accrue interest over the period um, and bill the customer you know, the next interest period or just roll it over in the principal. Um, we'll skip that. You can see it. Um, and this I've already gone over. Um, figuring out whether you want to do payment delay or a lockout um, or a look back are kind of complicated. The floating rate notes working group and loans working group have been working through them for three or four months. Um, so it's not the most fun you've ever had, I don't suppose. But um, they've come to some <laughs> conclusions. I think people are kind of gravitating towards um, a look back or a payment delay as opposed to a lockout. Um, and that reason is if you have a look at look back or a payment delay, um, that conforms very well with the swaps market, so it's easier to hedge. A lockout kind of freezes rates for a few days, and so you never really get that interest rate on those days. And there's some basis. Um, here you can see the basis, right? So a lockout will have basis if you're trying to hedge. On the other hand, not everyone does try to hedge, so they don't care if there's some basis to the swap market. Um, and for some investors, like say money market funds, they, like, they might like the lockout structure because on most days they're getting you know, a contemporaneous interest rate. Um, so different customer bases might like different conventions. Really, again, all you need to do is choose one. Uh, in the market, what people have tended to choose, first of all, Mostly they've used simple averages so far, but we are seeing some movement towards compounding. And in the UK, um, they've, I think, entirely used compounding from the start. So we know that compounding is possible. Uh, they've all been in arrears. Um, in the States, um, uh, we've tended to use a lockout or a suspension period, usually two days, um, with a one day look back. Uh, in the UK, um, they've tended to like, uh, a, well, a, that doesn't actually seem right, but okay. I think they've used a look back, right? Yeah. My table is wrong. I'm sorry. I'll fix it. So instead of five business days lockout, that should be five business day look back. Right? So I guess all this tells you is you can do these conventions. All of them are possible. Last thing I'm going to say is, you know, what about my hybrid models? In the user's guide, I show them for mortgages, and Brian is smiling because he knows no one's ever going to use them. But um, 
If you use one of my hybrid models, and no one's ever going to use these in mortgages, I don't believe. But if you did, and I use it as an example because there the basis can be extreme. You're looking at a one-year reset right now. You can eliminate basically all of uh, the basis, right? At the same time, you can give a payment structure to the borrower that's basically the same as an advance, right? So again, you can't, I don't think anyone is going to do this for the mortgage market. But in the loan market, you could do these pretty easily. In a loan to a large corporate, you could say, you know, we're going to set your interest rate in advance, but we'll track what happens over the interest rate period, and I'll just bill you next period for any difference, or I'll put it into principal. They would understand that. That would not be hard. That is a third way that you can use SOFR, and your problems are solved. You don't have any basis, and they know their um, payments way in advance. So you've got three ways that you can use SOFR now. You can use simple SOFR or maybe compound SOFR in arrears. People are already doing that. You can use SOFR in advance. People aren't doing that, but they could. You could use these hybrid models. Any of these will take very minimal adjustments to your systems. You could be doing them within you know, a month to two months if you had the will to do it. Other things may take more time. You have time to make those other adjustments. But you could be doing these things now, and I hope you will at least begin considering doing that. Right, thank you. So I'm keeping you from coffee, so I'm not going to do that. If you have any questions, you can come up to me afterwards, or you can call me at my office hours. Sorry for going over.
someone introduce me? Um, yeah, maybe, maybe we can have David sort of... So um, we did. We haven't met, have we? Uh, no, I'm Sai Srinivasan. I'm moderating the next panel. Oh, you are. Okay, yeah. good to meet you then, so Larry. Yeah, I, I, I'll do whichever is better. They obviously need to be seated, so I could either introduce yeah, myself. So, you wanna, you wanna, you, I'll introduce myself. Okay, it's fine. I think I'll do a better job. I gotta, I, I could, I'll, I, I'll keep it under 30 minutes. Okay. <laughs> it sounds better when you, it sounds better when you say it. <laughs> David, I, I told Brian I'm working on a new metaphor. You guys have used up all my metaphors, so I'm I have a new one. Okay? I want to get your mind thinking about it. It's 1910. Everybody has ice boxes at home. Refrigeration is about to get invented. Everybody's complaining. I don't want to spend the time to 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 get. Go, I don't want to have to build the infrastructure for a refrigerator, electricity, all that. I'm just going to wait for. I'm going to wait to see what happens. <laughs> in my comments, I will answer your question. I thought yeah. you would. Yeah, that's good. Thanks. Hey, how are you? Good. How are you?
I can see what's happening here, right? Okay. All right. All right. Do we have? So, so should I call? I think they'll they'll click it on. Should I call people in? Yeah. Let's. Why don't we? Do Yeah, it's good. Take charge. Okay, folks. Um, is this working? Hello? It's on. Okay. Uh, we're going to get started in a minute with the highlight of the day. Um, for those of you who love contract language, um, can you all please uh, come in and take your seats? We're eager to get started and um, try to keep ourselves on schedule. <laughs> How was that? Ice, ice boxes. Ice boxes. We're going to work on it. We said we're going to build the infrastructure. You want to you want to start building your infrastructure now or not? That's your choice. <laughs> Maybe the refrigerators will have a big place on top with ice in them for it, right? You can hope for that. That would be the term ice mode. <laughs> Okay, okay, very good. Uh, thank you all. So, um, uh, for those of you who are the uh, math wonks, the highlight of the morning was no doubtedly David's uh, portion of the presentation. Uh, for the rest of us, uh, this is the moment you've been waiting for. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, contract language um, fallback. Um, and uh, my name is Larry Stromfeld. Uh, I'm a partner at Cadwalder, Wickersham, and Taft. Uh, my firm was honored to have been selected by the ARC to assist in developing the fallback language across cash products. And I could tell you more, but David asked me to keep it very brief about myself. Um, I am honored to uh, be moderating this panel. Uh, we've all been doing this and working on it for many, many months, um, uh, 10 months at least, uh, if not longer. Um, and so we're all very experienced. We all have uh, been sharing the same metaphors about uh, how scary this all is. Um, but uh, we're very privileged to have this panel here today. Uh, to my immediate left, Ann Battle is Assistant General Counsel of ISDA. She's leading ISDA's initiatives in developing IBOR transition policies for the derivatives market. No small task. Uh, next to her, Hugh Benton, Vice President of the American Bankers Association and leading the development of the, had led the development of the ARC's uh, fallback language for bilateral loans. 
Uh, Aga Mirza is the managing director of CME Group, global head of interest rate products. He's leading CME's initiatives in developing transition policies for CME's cleared products. Uh, next to Aga is Alexis Peterson, uh, senior company counsel of Wells Fargo. Uh, she's leading uh, the Wells Fargo legal department's efforts in the LIBOR transition and also headed the ARC's floating rate note uh, working uh, group. Is that fair, Brian? I think she, yeah. Uh, Lisa uh, Pendergrass, next to, next to uh, Alexis, uh, is the executive director of the CRE Finance Council, co-headed the ARC Working Group in Developing Fallback Language for Securitizations. And then uh, Tess uh, Vermani is the Associate General Counsel, Senior Vice President of Public Policy at the LSTA, who also co-authored the ARC Fallback Language for Syndicated Loans. So as you see, we have representation here of the derivatives markets and the cash markets across many different products. Uh, to talk about fallback language. Um, so um, I'm not going to take the risk of introducing a new metaphor right now, although I'm working on one. Um, I, will, though, how, I will, however, say that uh, the one that I like uh, to use often, uh, Tom uh, Whip uh, uh, used first, which is stop digging the hole. Okay, so in 2000, as of the end of 2016, the expectation, uh, according to a, a Fed publication, is that there were $200 trillion of LIBOR transactions outstanding, transactions that reference LIBOR as a rate. Uh, the expectation is those will roll off um, and could be reduced to, uh, by the end of 2021, that significant date, to as little as $30 trillion. All right. Um, little. Uh, if we're going to do that, I was kind of looking at the calendar and thinking, you know, that's about a trillion dollars a month, assuming we've stopped digging the hole. Uh, so I think what we want to do is talk now about how to stop digging the hole. First thing, start issuing and originating uh, on, uh, not on LIBOR, but on SOFA products and other alternative reference rates. But short of that, how do we start, until that market is developed and we can fully move over to it, we need to, st we need to be taking our LIBOR contracts and originating with language that, that starts out with LIBOR but recognizes how do we move off of LIBOR when we need to. The key questions are when do we, need, when do, we do that and what do we move to. And so the ARC was very helpful in producing principle, guiding principles for what fallback language ought to do. And very quickly, uh, what that means is uh, less discretion in the language. So it's not, you know, when LIBOR goes away, I'll figure it out and I'll let you know. That sounds good. It's almost, it's almost seductive in a way because I don't have to worry. I'll figure it out at the time and I'll do it. But think about what it would mean to try to actually implement that if you wait until that time. And by the way, if you're exercising your discretion over here and you exercise it a little different over here, I promise you there's a regulator or a plaintiff's counsel out there who's going to come in and ask you why. So discretion is not really a good fix. The other is consistency across products. Right? We want to have the same live, we want to have the same fallback language across as many products as we can. And that's what we're going to be talking about here with these experts. And finally, feasibility and fairness. This is the other principle the, the ARC instructed us to abide by in the uh, developing fallback language. Feasible, right? It's all about feasibility. Can it be done? How do we introduce those uh, triggers and how do we introduce the fallback rate? And fairness of course, right? Because there's always the possibility of value transfer when you're moving off of a contract that previously referenced LIBOR and now is going to be moving to a different uh, reference rate. So with those goals in mind, we set out with many working groups to develop uh, fallback language for contract, new issuances of contracts that uh, initially referenced LIBOR. And we're going to start by turning to uh, Ann Battle of ISDA to tell us uh, how ISDA has been approaching this. Ann. Thanks, Larry. Oops, sorry. There we go. Um, so ISDA began work on updating our standard definitions that are used in interest rate derivatives to include more robust fallbacks at the request of the FSB OSSG, or Official Sector Steering Group, in the middle of 2016. Um, that work obviously became much more important or at least much more time sensitive in the middle of 2017 when the world learned about the uncertain future of LIBOR in particular. Um, today I'm going to focus primarily on fallbacks for U.S. dollar LIBOR, but our work does cover LIBOR in the other four currencies as well as a number of similar interest rate benchmarks. After determining relatively early on that the fallback rates should be the rates, 
that either were or would be identified by the relevant public private sector steering groups, such as the ARC, um, it became very apparent that there would need to be some sort of adjustment that would apply to those rates if the fallbacks took effect. As we are all painfully aware, the risk-free rates such as SOFR are inherently different than um, the IBORs such as LIBOR. And so we worked on that within our working groups throughout 2016 and 2017, but then ultimately determined that that adjustment that would apply if the fallbacks <clears throat> take effect is such a critical um, calculation that it was important for ISDA to gather feedback beyond its membership and in some cases beyond just derivatives market participants. And so last year, we launched a consultation on how those adjustments should be calculated that applied to LIBOR in a number of currencies other than US dollar LIBOR and a couple of other IBORs. Um, that consultation also asked preliminary questions about whether the adjustments selected out of that consultation should apply to US dollar LIBOR. Um, so I'm going to spend a couple of minutes going through the results of that consultation and the preliminary feedback, which, um, you know, just to go straight to the end, the preliminary feedback was that the adjustments likely did make sense for U.S. dollar LIBOR. Um, and then on the next slide, I'll talk about a consultation that's outstanding right now with the July 12th deadline, where we're looking to seek feedback on <coughs> U.S. dollar LIBOR in particular and several other IBORs. Um, so for adjusting the risk-free rate, such as SOFR, to um, cover the differences in the term structure, as David laid out, between SOFR and U.S. dollar LIBOR, um, the respondents to last year's consultation overwhelmingly, so over 90% of respondents, and we received responses um, in a number of jurisdictions, including the United States, from a number of different types of market participants. Over 90% of them um, preferred using a compounded in arrears. Um, I know that is very difficult for a number of non-derivatives products, but that result actually wasn't surprising for the derivatives market. Because as David explained, um, when market participants trade SOFR or SONIA or Fed funds today, the OIS market for those rates is based on a compounding setting in arrears. So for that reason and several other reasons, the respondents to the consultation, at least for the IBORs covered by that consultation, overwhelmingly supported using compounded setting in arrears, which is where at the end of the relevant interest rate period, whether that's one month or three month or six month, you would take a compounded average of the relevant overnight rate, um, such as SOFR, but as applicable to that consultation, for example, SONIA, over the three-month, one-month, or six-month period. So if the fallbacks take effect, that is, if um, they're, they're triggered and the event that triggered them actually occurs, whether it's a discontinuation or something else, then on that date that the fallbacks are actually taking effect, um, for, that, for any reset date for your swap after that date, you would take the compounding in arrears of SOFR or the other risk-free rate. Um, that would address the term structure, but it wouldn't address the difference in bank credit risk premium that's in the IBORs but not in the risk-free rates. And so after you compound the overnight rate, you need to add a spread adjustment. Um, the strong majority of respondents to last year's consultation um, preferred using a spread adjustment based on historical mean or median of the difference between the relevant IBOR and the relevant risk-free rate compounded over the relevant period. Now, how long you're going to go back to take that historical mean or median and whether you're going to use the mean or the median will remain subject to additional market feedback at the end of the summer. But um, respondents generally um, thought that that made the most sense. It was the most robust to manipulation of all of the approaches on the table. And um, you can 
you can do a number of different things with it, um, whether you use a, a short look back period, a long look back period, some sort of variation on those. And I would encourage everyone to go to the link on this slide, which you'll be able to click once these slides are on the ARCS website, um, to read about um, exactly how that spread adjustment would work and some of the feedback regarding the pros of that, uh, that approach versus some of the other approaches that were under consideration. Go to the next slide, Larry. So as I mentioned, there's a consultation outstanding right now. Um, we're not going to go into a lot more details today because there's a number of other panelists. But I would encourage you, um, if you go to the link at the bottom of this slide, there is a webinar that explains that consultation in greater detail. Um, David is speaking on that webinar, as well as Edwin Schooling Ladder from the UK Financial Conduct Authority. This consultation, the supplemental consultation that does cover US dollar LIBOR, as well as CDOR and HIBOR and certain aspects of SOAR, which is a interest rate benchmark in Singapore that uses US dollar LIBOR as an input and therefore would be impacted by a discontinuation of US dollar LIBOR. Again, it's very similar to the 2018 consultation, but uses that consultation as a starting point because as I mentioned earlier, preliminary feedback was that the preferences for last year's benchmarks did make sense for US dollar LIBOR um, specifically. And we also received feedback that it made sense to use the same adjustments across all of the IBORs that were implementing fallbacks for. So I encourage you to look at that consultation, to respond to it. You don't need to have responded to the 2018 consultation to respond to it. Um, if you did respond to the 2018 consultation and your firm's views remain the same, I encourage you to at least submit a letter to us letting us know that that is the fact so that we don't have to guess that your views are the same. There's actually a very easy way to do so. In the last page of the consultation, there's a button you can click and um, a form letter will pop up that you could use to con confirm your views. So I know there's a lot of work for everyone right now, but we're trying to make it as easy as possible to give us feedback at least on these points because when we implement our fallbacks in the definitions, they will apply going forward to all um, uh, non-cleared and to the extent incorporated by CCP's clear derivatives that use those definitions. So it is a very um, blunt tool and global application. So therefore, it is critical that these adjustments work for the entire marketplace in the event that they do take effect. And as we've heard, um, for LIBOR in particular, we do expect them to take effect. Um, there's a second consultation outstanding right now that's on pre-cessation issues. Um, we haven't covered this a lot today at the roundtable, but I encourage you to read that consultation and um, to read the publicly available letters and speeches, including a particular speeches by um, the FCA, related to um, what might happen if LIBOR in particular continues to be published, but is determined that it is no longer capable of representing Representing an underlying market. There's a very important series of questions in this consultation where we need feedback on what the derivatives market would do in that scenario so that we can determine the best way to implement that um, in derivatives documentation. Um, can I go to the next? And then I just want to um, conclude with a little bit of information about timing or next steps. Again, this will be available. and. Um, you're welcome to take pictures, but it's also available on the ISDA website. Um, there, as I mentioned, this consult, the consultations that are outstanding will close on July 12th. We're going to have to be very strict about that deadline because there's a neck, another phase of market feedback that we need to undertake before we can implement the fallbacks. And that relates to the final parameters of the spread adjustment in certain aspects of compounding. That will, unfortunately, but I'm giving you warning now, likely occur sometime during August and maybe even over the Labor Day holiday. Um, but hopefully that's something that everyone is thinking about now. You do have all of the information you need to think about those final parameters. So I encourage you to think about it as you respond to this consultation and then um, provide feedback at that time. We're also in the process, in, in the end stages, of selecting a vendor that will publish 
the adjusted fallback rates so that if you're used to going to a screen today to find three month US dollar LIBOR, if the fallbacks take effect, you will similarly be able to go to a screen to find the components of those fallback rate and the all-in fallback rate that your conference would that your contract would reference if the fallbacks take effect. Um, we hope that that vendor will begin publication of indicative fallback rates sometime at the end of this year so that once the fallbacks are in place contractually, market participants will be able to um, see what their contingent exposure to those fallback rates are. Um, we hope to finalize the amendments to our definitions and a protocol to include the fallbacks in legacy contracts by the end of this year, and then have approximately a three-month adherence period before anything takes effect. Um, you know, as uh, Governor Quarles helpfully mentioned, uh, we hope all market participants do adhere to the protocol to include the fallbacks in legacy <coughs> contracts. If you don't adhere during that three-month period, you still will be able to adhere. But the idea behind that period is so that at the end of it, um, the fallbacks take effect market-wide um, for cleared and non-cleared derivatives market participants at the same time to avoid um, complicated tracking of contracts with and without the fallbacks. Um, happy to take questions after today's roundtable, or if you want to email either fallbackconsult at isda.org or me directly, I would also be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Ann. So next I want to ask Aga to talk about the, uh, for the cleared uh, swap market, uh, how the uh, spreads and the, con and the cessation triggers are being addressed. Thanks, Larry, and thanks to NYU Stern for hosting. You know, uh, uh, on December 21st of last year, the day after ISDA published their fallback recommendations for the four non-dollar IBORs, CME Group issued a statement. Oh, sorry. Here's the next slide. Uh, CME Group issued a statement supporting efforts by the official sector, ARC, ISDA, and their industry-wide working groups to improve and strengthen LIBOR fallbacks. We intend to align with ISDA to include revised fallback language in our rules at a time which is concurrent with uh, uh, amendments or new definitions being adapted across the OTC derivative marketplace, uh, of, uh, of course, reserving the right to make necessary adjustments based on consultations with our clients. In May of 2019, last month, this process has taken additional steps forward with the two new ISDA IBOR consultations, uh, uh, the ones that uh, Anne talked about. Uh, these include uh, US dollar LIBOR. CME remains in close contact with ARC, ISDA, and our clients, and we will communicate our plans regarding these additional currencies at the appropriate times in relation to ISDA's work to achieve consensus across the industry. CME Group's views relating more broadly to LIBOR transition are summarized in our white paper, What's Next for LIBOR and Eurodollar Futures. Today, the ARC has asked me to uh, speak specifically about pre-secession triggers and the potential for their inclusion in the recommended fallback language for derivatives. We are aware of the recent guidance from the Financial Stability Board's Official Sector Steering Group, OSSG, encouraging consideration of pre-secession triggers in light of the potential challenges for market participants faced with non faced with a potential non-representative LIBOR rate. In this regard, we also thank ISDA for opening this issue up to the market for consultation. CME Group believes that a pre-secession trigger for derivatives contract is a potentially useful addition to the derivatives fallback language, providing additional clarity, <coughs> promoting alignment between cleared and uncleared derivatives market. We consider that it could provide a potential solution for market participants affected by the concerns identified by the OSSG regarding the use of non-representative 
rate. As acknowledged by ISDA in their pre-secession trigger consultation paper issued last month on May 16th, CME communicated to ISDA and regulators that subject to the detail and feedback of the consultation, we believe that market efficiencies could be achieved by alignment of how cleared derivatives operate with the pre-secession trigger for fallbacks in non-cleared contracts with the if the 2006 ISDA definitions were to include such a trigger. We have also communicated to ISDA and regulators that pre-secession events may trigger or prompt us to use our discretion to use an alternative reference rate if, for example, LIBOR was found to be non-representative by its regulator. Ultimately, CME Group believes that it is in the best interest of the marketplace to have consistency of approach in both triggers and fallback methodology between clear derivatives and ISDA's recommendations for fallbacks, to the extent this is possible and supported by our clients. CME Group operates several DCMs listing affected futures and options contracts, and also CME Clearing, our registered DCO, which has been deemed systemically important by the U.S. Financial Stability Oversight Council and which clears listed and swap contracts referencing LIBOR rates. We believe that alignment of both triggers and fallback language where possible between bilateral and clear derivatives will help to mitigate potential systemic disruptions and to facilitate orderly markets in the affected products, including those operated and cleared by CME Group. Thanks, Larry. Thank you, Aga. So we've just heard some of the challenges that are facing the differences between how to move off of LIBOR in the, in the non-cleared and cleared swap uh, markets. And now I'm going to turn over to Alexis, who's going to start to talk about uh, how fallback language is being introduced to the cash markets, and in particular with the uh, floating rate notes. Thank you, Larry. So as you heard from Vice Chairman Quarles, it would be best not to rely on fallback language at all, and instead to enter into products that reference so far. However, um, since products do continue to use LIBOR, there was a consensus at the ARC that more robust and consistent LIBOR fallback language was needed across cash products to reduce market disruption. The ARC proceeded to issue guiding principles and then last fall launched four market-wide consultations on fallback language for floating rate notes, syndicated loans, bilateral business loans, and securitizations. After reviewing all of the feedback from those consultations and discussing the issues further, the ARC has now published recommended fallback provisions for those cash products as well as related commentary and user's guides that are on its website. To the extent that market participants continue to enter into LIBOR-based products, the ARC recommends this fallback language and believes the cash markets will benefit by adopting a more consistent, transparent approach. So what does the ARC's fallback language look like? The fallback language has clearly defined trigger events a successor rate, and an adjustment to the successor rate to make it closer to what the parties originally intended. In addition, the fallback language expressly allows for conforming administrative changes that might be needed to account for the move from LIBOR to the successor rate. So now I will speak about the ARC's fallback language at a high level for floating rate notes. And specifically, I'll start off with the triggers. Thank you, Larry. There are three trigger events in the ARC's fallback language for FRNs. The first two triggers require the permanent discontinuation of LIBOR. And they align with the triggers that ISDA intends to use in its definitions. The third trigger event would occur upon a public statement by the FCA that LIBOR is no longer capable of representing underlying markets. 
And if this announcement is made, LIBOR could continue to be published. As you heard from Anne, ISDA is consulting on whether to include this trigger in its definitions. Okay, we can go to the next slide. So now I will speak about the floating rate note fallback language waterfall of benchmark replacements. The way that the waterfall works is that the issuer or another designated party will look at whether the successor rate set forth at the very top of the waterfall is available. And if that can be determined, that will be the fallback that is implemented. But if it's not, then one would move down to the next step in the waterfall and so forth. So the first step in the waterfall is a forward-looking term so far endorsed by the relevant governmental body, which may be the ARC, plus an adjustment. But it's important to note a few things about this step number one. First, forward-looking term so far, as you heard from Tom Whiff today, does not exist, and there is no guarantee that the ARC will see a robust rate that it can recommend prior to the discontinuation of LIBOR. Second, derivatives will not fall back to the forward-looking term rate, and the ARC has specifically stated in the related commentary that removing this first step for greater alignment with swaps is acceptable. And third, while the market did support a forward-looking term so far as the optimal fallback for products that were originally written referencing LIBOR, the ARC does not recommend, I would like to emphasize, that you wait on the sidelines until forward-looking terms so far exist to begin using so far in cash products. Okay, the second step in the waterfall is compounded so far plus an adjustment. Compounded SOFAR would be created by calculating the compounded average of daily SOFAR rates during the interest period. The ARC's language actually allows for the conventions of this rate that David discussed to be set in the future based on either a recommendation from the ARC or market practice. However, for floating rate notes, this rate will be set in arrears, meaning near the end of the interest period. The ARC specifically notes in the commentary that compounded SOFAR, however, may be replaced by a simple average of SOFAR for operational ease. The next three steps in this waterfall are intended to ensure the contract has a robust fallback provision even after LIBOR has been replaced by a version of SOFAR pursuant to one of the first two steps. So they are addressing the remote possibility that so far is discontinued during the life of this contract. The third step is a rate recommended by the relevant governmental body as the fallback for so far, plus an adjustment. The fourth step in the waterfall looks to the fallback rate for so far in the ISDA definitions at the time the fallback is activated, plus an adjustment. Based on consultation feedback, the ARC decided to leave room for changes in the future to the ISDA definitions rather than hardwiring the fallbacks for SOFAR that are in the ISDA definitions today. And finally, if all else fails, one would use an adjusted rate selected by the issuer or its designee, giving due consideration to any industry accepted practice at that time. So I mentioned that there's an adjustment to each fallback rate at every step of this waterfall. And the ARC's FRN language actually has a waterfall for the adjustment itself. And I'll now give you a high level overview of that waterfall. The top of this benchmark replacement adjustment waterfall is a spread adjustment recommended by the relevant governmental body for the applicable fallback rate. If the ARC recommends forward-looking terms so far as the fallback for cash products, it will also recommend a spread adjustment for terms so far. The next step is a spread adjustment set forth in the ISDA definitions for derivatives. And the bottom of this waterfall is an adjustment selected by the issuer or its designee, giving due consideration to any industry accepted practice at that time. Okay, last one. Um, I'd like to highlight a few key issues. 
So floating rate note fallbacks include a pre-cessation trigger. And as you heard, ISDA is consulting on whether to add this trigger. That could lead to a mismatch between notes and derivatives if ISDA does not include the pre-cessation trigger. I encourage you to respond to the ISDA consultation. Second, the primary fallback rate. I will highlight again that the first fallback in the ARCS language is to a forward-looking term so far plus an adjustment, which will not be the fallback for derivatives. This is why modifications to remove the first step of the waterfall are explicitly allowed by the ARC and noted in the user's guide. And finally, because floating rate nodes can be long dated and difficult to amend, the fallback provisions for floating rate nodes are hardwired, meaning that they don't require consents at the time they are activated. And the waterfall of replacement rates is also long, so that there would continue to be a workable fallback provision in the contract, even if LIBOR has been replaced by SOFAR. Um, there, there are actually other differences with the loans because they have two different approaches, but I will let my colleagues speak to that further. Thank you so much, Larry. Thank you, Alexis. So uh, as Alexis was just saying, um, the, 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 these provisions, these waterfalls uh, exist because we're trying, to, we're trying to contractualize today what you will do in the future for circumstances that are not yet certain. Uh, so that's why we have a waterfall. The waterfall is essentially saying, let's look around at the time this occurs and figure out what we want to do. Um, and so the cash markets have a waterfall of what the, uh, of what the uh, pr priorities are for or preferences are for what you would apply in terms of the rate and the spread. And that's particularly important with floating rate notes because they are widely distributed and you're talking about modifying the interest rate. And you, uh, it's, it's difficult, if not impossible, and I'm going to go on the record and say it's impossible, uh, to, to amend widely distributed capital market securities to, uh, without the, and by getting, trying to get the consent of the holders, uh, because generally that requires 100% consent. And a lot of these are in street name, et cetera, et cetera. It's very hard to get. So that's a, that's a particular challenge to uh, uh, modifying the rate uh, from the LIBOR rate to the new rate, which is why we try to hardwire, uh, what we're calling hardwire, what happens at that time. Uh, but when you have a, a loan, uh, whether it's a bilateral loan or a syndicated loan, uh, the nature of that instrument is a little bit easier to, to modify at the time. And so I'm going to turn it over to Tess and to Hugh to talk about how uh, bilateral loans and syndicated loans have, uh, are dealing with a fallback language, recognizing the differences uh, of that uh, and the nature of those products. Thanks, Larry. Um, nice to be with you this morning. And I've had the pleasure of working on the loans recommendations with Hugh Benton, who's with us today, and um, Jeff Nagel, partner at Kidwallader. And I'm going to speak about the two approaches that we have for loans. This is unique. It's not found in the recommendations for the other products because the two approaches really go to the nature of a loan and there is more inherent flexibility in a loan than in the other cash products that we're discussing this morning. So before, um, I think to start, I'd like to look at the hardwired approach, which is uh, very closely aligned with the recommend recommended fallback language in the other cash products. The, in, in the loans recommendation, we use the same triggers as found in the in floating rate notes, other cash products. The first two steps of the um, relevant waterfalls, both for the replacement rate and the spread adjustment, are um, almost entirely the same. You, first choice is term SOFR, and the second choice would be compounded SOFR. The differences, which I'll highlight, are really more um, just a function of the, the different nature of the product. So um, the first one I would flag is that the loans recommended language has early opt-in triggers. This is, again, unique to loans, but this would allow for um, the uh, essentially the transition to a replacement rate to happen before LIBOR were to be discontinued or before any of the um, described triggers would have come to pass. 
And what this does is, is use the, um, the ability to amend loans in certain circumstances to help reduce the, in, the inventory of loans outstanding. So it helps you to kind of work down your book, so to speak. Um, the, uh, some variant of the early opt-in trigger is found in both uh, the hardwired approach and the amendment approach for loans. It's drafted slightly differently, though. In the hardwired approach, the way it's drafted, if you were to um, transition to a replacement rate through the early opt-in, you would end up in um, term SOFR and uh, spread adjustment. Um, and in the amendment approach, it's, it's drafted more, more broadly. So that's the first um, difference. So again, mandatory triggers, all the you know two cessation triggers and the pre-cessation trigger, those are all the same across the products. This is the um, only trigger difference. Then the, um, within the rate waterfall itself, the sequencing is identical, but the definition of compounded SOFR in the loans language is slightly different. So whereas Alexis described, compounded SOFR is drafted to be um, in arrears in the um, floating rate note context, in loans it could be in advance or in arrears. We, we flag that in arrears is possible, but um, it's drafted broadly enough that it could be both. Um, however, the, the waterfall approach is the same across the product. So the conventions are not determined today. They are determined um, in the future. And that is either by reference to ARC recommended conventions or um, conventions that are seen in a certain number of syndicated loans in the market. So in the, consul in the recommendation, we, we say five parties can choose what's the appropriate threshold. But we look to then that objective standard. Finally, um, Alexis had flagged that our, the waterfalls are um, you know, longer and floating rate notes. In loans, we do have shorter waterfalls, and that's because the third step, so the final step in both the um, benchmark replacement rate um, waterfall <coughs> as well as the um, adjustment waterfall, is the selection of the rate and adjustment through an amendment process. And so if one of the predetermined rates or spreads is not available, the borrower and the um, administrative agent are going to select the rate and adjustment, and then um, majority of lenders will have the right to object to, to that selection. But that is how, um, th that is the final step, that is sort of the, the fail safe, and, and that is also how um, loans are, are future proofed under the hardwired approach. The two final um, differences I would flag is that in um, the loans language, the is to spread adjustment would be available for use both if the uh, successor rate is term SOFR or compounded SOFR. That's a slight difference in, the, um, in the, the, the drafting between the two. And then we also have explicit um, reference to the rates and spreads being available on a screen. So um, we say that it, under either the first or second step of the waterfalls, that that rate or spread would be available on a screen. It doesn't apply in the um, third step, the kind of fail-safe step, um, to ensure you know, success of the language. But we are more explicit about that. And um, in addition, because in loans you can have borrowings in uh, different tenors, the administrative agent has been given the ability to um, remove tenors for which there is no screen rate available. Those tenors could be reinstated later, but that is a way to deal with the, um, the variability that you can have in loans that you wouldn't find in, in other products. So then just looking at the amendment approach as um, an alternative, this is um, really a creature of what the market developed for itself, and then the um, our recommended language, I think, has several notable en enhancements to it. It is something that is really uniquely workable only for loans because of the structure of loans. But I would also note that if um, the language were to be um, kind of made effective and you were to actually transition to a replacement rate using the amendment process, it would be operationally um, largely unfeasible and tr truly problematic if you were to have to um, transition your to your whole loan book, your whole portfolio to a replacement rate in a short amount of time. So that's something that we should be aware of as we, we look at the approach. 
essentially what it does is set forth a process for determining a, a replacement rate and spread adjustment in the future. So um, similarly to what I described in, as the last step in the hardwired approach, here you would have a bar, the borrower and the administrative agent would select a replacement rate and spread adjustment giving um, you know, due consideration to any recommendation by um, a relevant governmental body, say the, the ARC or the Fed, um, or to any evolving or then prevailing market convention for um, US dollar syndicated loans. And then um, required lenders, which is typically majority of lenders, would have the ability to object to that rate. Um, and that is what we've actually seen in the market. Um, Covenant Review had done some analysis on this, and about 71% of um, first quarter 19 institutional loans had this um, general architecture. And so we, um, we have followed suit. There are, th this recommendation does exist for loans as well. But just before I hand it over to Hugh, maybe stop a second to look at why one would mm. choose one approach over the other. And one of the you know, benefits of the amendment approach is it is similar and, and familiar to the market, so it's less of a, of a change to market practice were you to adopt this. Um, it doesn't rely on terms that we have not seen yet, you know, the, the forward-looking term rate that would be recommended by, by ARC. However, it does um, lend itself to gamesmanship, depending on where we are in the credit cycle. You can see the borrower lenders perhaps ending up in a, a better position, so that's something to be mindful of. Um, it could delay operational plans, because you don't have a set rate that you'd be working towards. And then, of course, um, operationally is very burdensome, as I flagged earlier. So for the hardwired approach, you know, you have the, the other side of that coin. The, um, you, you have certainty now. You don't have the um, likelihood of, of gamesmanship. You can build operationally towards something definite and is, you know, should be largely executable because you most, most cases don't need any um, lender consent in order to transition. So this is just what um, to, to think about when looking at the two approaches. I would also just f f um, end on the um, note that in the consultation feedback, even the proponents of the amendment approach did acknowledge that a hardwired approach did make sense for the loan market as well at, um, at a future time. So Hugh, maybe I'll hand it over to you to talk about bilaterals. Okay, thanks very much, Tess. And Larry, if you could advance to slide 15, please. Um, as was mentioned earlier, we tried to maintain a consistent approach uh, across products, and we were particularly lucky in doing this in syndicated and bilateral business loans because it meant that I was able to build on the work that uh, Tess and her colleague Meredith Coffey had done in developing the syndicated loans approach. So in the bilateral loans approach, we maintain uh, the choice between an amendment and a hardwired approach, but there are some key differences I'll highlight especially uh, the rights of the borrower to give or withhold negative consent to the implementation of some of the provisions, such as the choice of an, or the implementation of a new benchmark uh, or spread adjustment, and also whether the lender will have the right to exercise the early opt-in. The parties will have to decide whether the borrower uh, will have negative consent rights with respect to these provisions. And within the business loans working group, different members felt very strongly either that a choice should be made available or that a choice should not be made available. On the one hand, uh, those who wanted uh, fewer negative consent rights on the borrower's part were concerned about uh, implementing changes and benchmark conversions in a number of contracts simultaneously over a short period of time and the operational risk that that would create. Uh, if they had to deal bilaterally with borrowers uh, in uh, a number of different contracts. On the other hand, uh, so other lenders felt that it was important to give uh, their customers that right so that they would uh, have uh, a, a more clearer consensus in the transaction uh, to transition to a new benchmark. Uh, the 
bilateral approach also gives the parties the option to refer to other syndicated and bilateral transactions in the market in deciding whether to exercise the early opt-in trigger. Uh, syndicated transactions are more likely to have public information available, but bilateral transactions are more likely to be similar to the transaction in question, and therefore the parties uh, could have the option to refer to either one. Finally, uh, because the parties expressed a strong interest in maintaining alignment with the hedge markets, uh, there is a third option included in bilateral uh, fallback language to uh, follow exactly the triggers and other uh, provisions of ISDA contracts and maintain alignment with hedges. Uh, this uh, type of language, uh, while it could be extremely complex operationally, may have application to other kinds of uh, cash market transactions as well. And as long as people approach it thoughtfully and with understanding, uh, the working group believed it would be a useful tool. Thank you. Thank you, Hugh. Okay, so we heard about the challenges that uh, exist and how we're approaching these uh, with fallback language for each particular type of uh, product um, and uh, trying to recognize the nature of that product. We've also heard about the challenges that exist between products. Now, Lisa's going to bring it home for us because in securitizations, they have all of that. Uh, you've, got, uh, you've got challenges, and at securitization, you've got the asset, and you also have the liability, and um, how are we going to deal with, uh, with the fallback language when, we have, when we're dealing with uh, two different levels? So, Lisa, take us home. Great. Thank you, Larry. Um, yes, yeah, so the asset liability issue is certainly one um, that we would consider. The other is the multiple asset classes. Uh, so oftentimes what we had to do during our conversations with our working groups was step back, take a sort of a larger approach um, to what we can do, um, and then I think at some point the individual markets will develop and fill in those things that are particular to their market. But we've set up, I think, a, a decent regime where they can follow sort of the uh, sort of hardwired approach, if you will, um, and, and it works. I think there's lots of things to work out, again, during, in the individual asset classes is a, somewhat of a concern, but I think the structure is right. We've worked a good amount um, on trying to, uh, to make it amenable to all of the various asset classes. So just to start, the securitization triggers, we originally had six. We now have four, two of the same um, cessation triggers as the other working groups have. Um, we also have adopted the pre-cessation trigger um, that LIBOR is no longer representative. Of course, that does add a certain level of basis risk. It'll be interesting, and I too would ask everyone to please respond to um, Ann's consultation, is this consultation um, on that front. Um, we also have a, a fourth trigger that is very much a, a securitization specific trigger. So it really looks to the assets relative to the liabilities. So when more than 50% of your assets are referring to something other than LIBOR, that is your trigger um, to move. So that's a, a particular asset um, or trigger that I think um, our members were very um, eager to see in this uh, in this process. Glad to have it, actually. It took a, a good amount of negotiation. Um, on the benchmark replacement rate waterfall, um, not a significant difference. Term sulfur and spread adjustment is, you know, is the first. Compounded sulfur is the second. We had um, significant difficulties in determining how to compound. Um, I think that almost everyone in our, on our group, and they were over uh, 100, uh, were of the view that they would have preferred compounded in arrears. Um, however, there were significant operational challenges to that. We went back and forth for quite some time um, and ultimately determined that we were going to leave it to the designated transaction rep to determine which best, which is best in terms of a compounding. So it could be simple, it could be in, uh, in arrears, it could be in advance. Um, and again, that was something that took a good amount of negotiation, um, but we did get there and it, and it does allow for some flexibility. Um, as we know, is just using compounded in arrears, um, not term. And, and at the end of the day, our, our members were very much focused on they want a term rate. Um, and it was sort of like, no, you can't have that piece of candy because, you know, dinner time. But it was, it, but it was, it was generally um, sort of a process where we moved, okay, understand that so the term rate may not be available, so what's the next best step? Compounding in arrears was generally the, the view. However, after much negotiation, it was determined that you know we probably could use that flexibility, particularly given the number of asset classes and, and the views that we had amongst our members. 
Um, the other is, you know, just the ARC selected replacement spread, the ISTAS selected replacement spread. And then also we have at the end, our step five in this waterfall would be that the designated transaction rep, the DTR, um, selects the replacement and the spread. Um, and again, following somewhat market con um, conventions. One other thing that we had talked about um, a good amount was the whole idea of retesting. Um, so we had a, a longer waterfall at one point. Um, it is now at uh, step five. Um, however, what we decided to do was to inject an opportunity to retest as to what's best available. Again, most everyone would want it, everyone would want to see term SOFR. So the fact that we allow now them, once they get to step two, which is compounding, um, they're allowed to go back and retest every period to see if term SOFR is in fact available. Um, and, and this is something that, you know, there's always a tension between the trustees, servicers, those who have to actually go back and retest. Um, and the potential legal issues that you could that could arise from that. Right now, it seems like a sensible way to go, particularly given the fact that we know that at some point there will be a term sofa, and, and it may be nice to have that in there. So that's sort of where we went on that. Um, the benchmark replacement spread, there really isn't uh, anything different in ours than there is in the other products. Um, again, at the, the last uh, step, however, would be that that designated transaction rep um, can choose the applicable benchmark. Uh, replacement, so, um, or adjustment. So that's sort of the, the big pictures. I, I do think we added some conforming changes, um, allowing the, the, those who are the designated transaction rep to review and to do what's best and what's the norm in the, in the, uh, in the marketplace. And then again, the individual marketplaces, you know, there are probably 14 different core asset classes out there um, within securitizations. And so they'll, that may determine, that may vary from, from asset class to asset class. Um, so really with that, that's the, the most significant um, you know, differences that I can highlight. Thank, thank you, Lisa, and I'm mindful of the time. So I won't be able to get to questions, but I want to thank you all very much and thank our panel. Doesn't matter. Whichever. <laughs> they'll, they'll, uh, they'll put the okay. uh, new one on if, like, if they can pause on the live feed right now. Okay. So much time to go past. 45 minutes. For the fun minutes. I think it's still good morning, I guess. Uh, Sai Srinivasan, uh, CFTC. 
uh, for various reasons. I've sort of had three different roles in the past few years at uh, CFTC, but I've still been the point person on everything to do with uh, benchmark reforms, spending a lot of time on ARC matters, and also on the, uh, the official sector. Uh, we all hold two full-time jobs, just like many of you. Uh, it's a honor, actually, to, uh, uh, to moderate this panel. We have the uh, very rich set of experiences here, so I just want to sort of jump into uh, the discussion. So. Um, Sort of, uh, I had a, the, the list of names in a particular order, and I messed things up completely. Uh, but I'll try my best. Uh, Brian uh, Grabenstein, who's the managing director and head of uh, LIBOR transition office at Wells Fargo. Uh, Sarah Berkey, who's the head of policy at Structured Finance Industry Group. Uh, Rich Chambers, managing director, global head, short-term macro trading at uh, Goldman Sachs. Uh, Tom Dees, who's the chairman of the National Association of Corporate Treasurers. Uh, Chris McAllister, managing director, global head of derivatives trading and prudential. Uh, and then Alice uh, Wang, who's a managing director and strategy executive, uh, corporate and investment bank at JB Morgan. Uh, and before I, we all have this discussion. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Nadine Bates, who's the senior vice president and treasurer, uh, uh, Fannie Mae. Uh, and this is one thing which uh, David didn't do, but I'm going to do it on behalf of both of us. Uh, anything that we say is our personal views and doesn't represent the views of either the Fed or the CFTC. I don't know if you said that, but I thought I should do that. <laughs> so for the record, uh, we have the, uh, the two disclaimers, I guess. Uh, so it's been, uh, you know, this is a good wrap up because you've heard a lot of the, a lot of work is happening on the, you heard the official sector's view. Uh, so I'm going to sort of uh, kick off with uh, first Rich and then uh, if Chris sort of sell side by side perspective. Uh, you know, where is the current derivatives markets? What's the current state? Uh, where are we headed? Uh, and if you can also talk about sort of the key uh, events which we're expecting to happen in the next 12 months, the ISTA protocol, and also uh, some of the, there was a reference to the PAI uh, discounting, sort of the big bang approach, some of the discussions that are happening. So Rich, if you can go first, and then Chris, if you can. Sure. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for uh, ha uh, having us here. Um, the current derivatives market is liquid uh, and active. Uh, Unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, but just in terms of the way it is, it, it, it's active and liquid in LIBOR space still. Um, to put into context, uh, based on SDR data, uh, since uh, the launch of the SOFR index, we've seen 6.2 million DV01 of OTC SOFR swaps trade uh, in the last year. Um, roughly two thirds of those have been outright fixed versus floating. Um, and the majority of of those have been within the the uh, you know short end zero is zero to five years uh, in duration space. Um, you know we have OTC derivatives, we have exchange traded derivatives. Um, you know d in terms of co uh, context, the the open interest on SOFR SOFR contracts on the exchange uh, comprise of roughly five percent of the total open interest on, of Fed funds contracts at the moment. So. Whilst this is obviously still in its infancy stage, uh, the liquefaction uh, is 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 very much um, uh, uh, you know step by step. And what what I mean by step by step, it, it, it you know we, we we have a lot of hurdles to get over uh, across the uh, investor commu investor based community. Um, the current uh, composition of, of, of users in, in, in SOFR derivatives right now, uh, I would say, are very much the fast money community in the very, very short end. Um, they, you know, certainly uh, are, are a lot quicker to to move over both from an infrastructure point of view, but also from an overall market standing understanding point of view. Um, and then uh, beyond the two-year point, we have seen a lot of duration hedging uh, against issuance, um, but very little liquidity and very little uh, SOFR derivatives have traded beyond the 10-year point. Uh, you know, it's just been some inter-dealer bank-to-bank uh, -bank trades. Um, so the end-user type um, derivative transactions uh, have not come to pass yet in, in, in the longer end of the curve. 
the question is why is liquefaction um, uh, as slow as it is? Is it slow? I, you know, I think that the, there is a there is a fair. Um, uh, there is a fair uh, divergence in terms of, uh, you know, uh, where we would, in terms of opinions, in terms of where we would be, we would be uh, looking, looking back at, uh, 12 months ago to, to today. Um, there, there's still an element of inertia in the market. Uh, uh, you know, people are used to doing the same thing and to change. Uh, a cost money, uh, cost resources, and uh, there is. Um, there, you know, it's certainly uh, uh, it, it's a, there's also an understanding element as well, uh, comfort with the index, comfort with the overall understanding of so, of the sofa product. But clients and the and and uh, uh, are the are the overall uh, client base are getting are getting more comfortable with sofa. Uh, that that is for sure, and definitely uh, ha are getting a greater understanding of the index. And um, another major. Not major hurdle, but it's an ongoing hurdle in in the sell side is uh, the liquidity charge to execute a sofa swap. Um, you know, you know, we still have a hugely liquid um, um, LIBOR-based products uh, that extend out to thirty years and even beyond in some cases. Um, and uh, to to you know the to when when you have uh, a lot of stepping stones in place in terms of you know the the the, the future of sofa and uh, and the future of libor uh, our client base are just somewhat sitting on our hands uh, sitting on their hands but um, and, and and just playing the waiting game right now but what are the major stepping stones that will help liquefy sofa um, obviously is the fallback definition um, you know you know I, I I'm a firm believer uh, and and you know I'm personally that once we um, uh, define what the fallback rate will be for derivative contracts, you will see all other bases in, in, in the dollar swaps market and, and other swap markets uh, converge to, to that pricing. Uh, and what that means is it will be a lot, it will, lot easier for the sell side community to recycle risk and rehypothecate risk because there will be, more, uh, there will be a more defined clearing level for, for these bases. Um, the uh, PAI change uh, for of C CCPs, which is you know, um, uh, we're, we're due to uh, um, have um, you know go through that in in, in Q2 2020. Uh, will you know after after day one, it will create so for uh, derivatives risk uh, for all uh, active members in CCPs, and that will organically help liquefy uh, the product. Um, so they're the two major stepping stones uh, that will, you know, yeah, will you know help uh, more end user type clients uh, into the market and and, and into the product. Um, they, you know, we, we, we th in terms of in terms of timeline, uh, we feel that most of our clients are are, are waiting uh, until we get get through those events. Um, th there's also. The you know the other potential stepping stones that can that we can see you know like and that will definitely help uh, sofa and help uh, help us uh, continue to liquefy it you know if, you know in time if there is a definitive discontinuation date uh, of LIBOR, it will help um, you know there is a, you know clear uh, and clear agreement on accounting treatment for for um, so for in, in terms of FASB and IFRS. Uh, I know there has been a lot of uh, headway made in that, but to, to, uh, to w once we get over that hurdle, uh, we, we feel we'll see a lot of bank portfolios enter the market as well and, and start to trade so for swaps. Uh, so that's very much a, a bird's eye view as to where we are in SOFR uh, and where we are in SOFR derivatives on the sell side. Thanks. Uh, Chris? Uh, thanks. I, uh, I'm going to invoke the same uh, statement that say, yeah, these are uh, my opinions and not necessarily those are pronounced. Sorry about that. But um, yeah, uh, I think um, when we think about the, the situation from an end user perspective, um, the transition from LIBOR to SOFR is something uh, for participants in the market that has a pretty bad chart ratio. It's got a lot of risk with no expected return. So I think the focus um, for people with net risk is trying to find ways to reduce that risk uh, uh, and I think uh, one of the best ways to probably do that, if you think about it, is, is the protocol. 
Um, it's going to be very big risk reduction for the entire market. Uh, to Richard's point, it will give us more clarity around the values of the contracts we currently have. Uh, and I think the other thing to think about, too, is, is to the extent that um, the clearinghouses are going to fall back to uh, similar things, um, it, it just makes sense from a standpoint that you're going to have a large majority of your book uh, is going to go there. Uh, and, and so the protocol is probably going to be something that can take a lot of risk out of the system. Uh, I would agree with, with Richard. Um, you know, we're, we're involved in the long end of the market a lot. So, uh, and we continue to monitor liquidity. And, um, and you know, it's, it's not there, but, um, you know, we can't predict when it's going to be there. But um, we, we do continue to monitor that and prepare ourselves for, for when it's available. Um, and, and I think uh, big bang on PAI is something that will certainly help with that um, because to Richard's point, it's going to immediately create uh, some risk in the market that people are going to then have to um, find ways to transform and, and move that risk. And that will offer opportunities for other people that have uh, natural risk there that they need to hedge. Um, they can be part of that liquidity solution. Uh, again, I think somebody said earlier, this is, uh, Tom, you know, this is, this is a problem for all of us. This isn't... Uh, uh, a Federal Reserve problem. This isn't a, a sell side problem. Um, we all need to be part of the solution. And I think uh, things like the PI will give us the opportunity to do that. So, Thanks. Uh, Brian, can you talk to us about uh, what's happening in the FRN market? Uh, David spoke about some of the issuance activity. And then if you can also tell us as to where is it headed in the next. Sure, comments. sure. Uh, well, thank you for that. So first of all, you know, the state of the SOFR-based uh, FRN market, I think, is strong, and I hope it gets stronger. Um, as you heard earlier, we've had something uh, to the two, we've had over 100 billion of SOFR-based FRNs issued in less than a year. Uh, they come from a wide range of issuers, financial and non-financial. Um, they're generally printing through LIBOR, meaning that on a swaps adjusted basis, uh, issuers are actually getting more cost-effective funding Issue, uh, issuing based against SOFR as opposed to based against LIBOR. I think another point to remember is that all of the deals done to date have been done on an in arrears convention. So FRNs used to be done using LIBOR, forward-looking uh, rate by definition. Um, so now they're all being done in arrears. And you know, having done one at Wells Fargo and having you know, talked to our DCM desk, it was a non-event for, for the investor base. And we had a, a very well uh, we, we had a very strong book build, and I understand this is a common experience. Um, another institution just did a deal based on um, compounded SOFR in arrears, and I think that that was a big step for the market. I talked to um, one of the individuals that was involved in that transaction, and he said, again, they had a very, very uh, robust investor book, um, and I think that's, that's a, again, a sign of things to come. If you look over at the UK, uh, the Sonia market, um, compounded in arrears has become more or less the standard over there. So, so I, do, I do think that's going to become the case. Um, and I just think, you know, again, we're not even a year into it. Um, we're going to see a lot more. I'll say two, maybe two more things. The first is that um, while, uh, you know, the $100 billion in issuance, uh, both on a simple average and a compound average uh, uh, basis, have proven that it is uh, very feasible, to, uh, to use in arrears rates, to use so for in arrears. I do think that some of the uh, rates that are going to be published early next year are going to add to the ease uh, and the market acceptance of in arrears rates. And, and personally, I hope that uh, in addition to just publishing some rates, we also, uh, uh, the Fed will also con uh, consider publishing some sort of index that would allow for any two uh, dates uh, us to have um, uh, a SOFA rate in arrears uh, and remove some of the, the math that a system might have to do or a calculation agent might have to do. Um, the last point that I'd like to make is, you know, we, we heard an excellent panel before on fallbacks and a year's worth of work went into devising what are um, very, very good, but at the same time, very, very complicated to some extent, uh, mechanisms for transferring from LIBOR to SOFR. And so when I think about a product like uh, a floating rate note, which as Larry mentioned earlier, is, is functionally possible, impossible rather to amend, you know, I think as people focus more and more on um, you know, the inherent risk that's involved with a fallback, that more and more people, especially as we approach uh, the end of 2021, will conclude that, you know, the best thing to do is to issue against SOFR, and we now have, have models to do that. 
Thank you, Brian. Uh, Nadine, can you uh, share your perspectives? I have a two-part question for you. One is uh, your perspectives on the FR and market, uh, and also uh, how's the, mar the mortgage market, and especially the residential real, real estate market, how it's preparing for the whole transition? Sure, sure. So, um, you know, as Brian mentioned, um, you know, we're really pleased with um, the adoption of the SofaLink debt in the um, unsecured debt markets. Um, our issuance was the first one, and it was back in July, so it actually hasn't even been a year. Um, it's only been about 10 months, and to have over $100 billion, I think that's tremendous progress in a very short period of time. Um, the other thing, um, because at Fannie Mae we touch so many different types of products, um, I did want to lend one perspective on the derivatives market based on what Chris and Richard just mentioned, which is um, we have been able to util utilize SOFA derivatives as a hedging tool um, that we use. So we don't trade derivatives, but we do use them to hedge with. And um, we were pleased um, to be able to, we're, we're not going out into the very long end, but in the intermediate sector and shorter, we've been able to hedge multi-billion dollar debt issuances over the last couple months. So although the depth of the market isn't what you see in the derivatives market, there are opportunities to be able to use this product. And so we've effectively been able to use it and we're really um, happy with the outcome. Um, the other thing that's been talked a lot about today is the fallback language and triggers. And so at Fannie Mae over the last couple of years, to the extent we could improve any of our disclosures, we've used those opportunities to do so. And so most recently, um, we adopted the ARC's floating rate no LIBOR trigger and fallback language um, for some of our securities. Um, this was specifically for our REMIC securities and specifically CMOs. And so that just is basically June 1st is what that, when that became effective. So I would really, really encourage um, market participants to review the final recommendation um, by product of the enhanced, enhanced language. Um, and if you deem it appropriate, use it. Um, we've found it to be um, very helpful in helping us think about um, some of the gaps that we've had in some of our past disclosures. Um, the other thing, obviously none of this is easy. Um, what we're trying to do at Fannie Mae um, in the residential mortgage market is something that we did in the debt markets, which is um, to try to innovate with what we have today and not wait for what might be there in the future. So we talked to, we work collaboratively with um, FHFA, our regulator, Freddie Mac, and other Mark, um, other ARC members that are represented here today. And I think earlier it was mentioned that there's a new consumer products working group. Um, this working group is comprised of, um, it's got participation from lenders, servicers, consumer advocacy groups, investors, and the GSEs. Um, we're hoping in the next month or two, or, and I'll deem it this summer, that the consumer working group will circulate an outline of a potential new ARM product. Um, this product is going to be using the overnight SOFA rate that's already being published. Um, we hope that this new product could be an alternative to using LIBOR for um, new ARM loan origination. Um, ultimately, market participants are going to have to determine if the product or something similar is right for them, but we believe it's a great start in trying to innovate with what um, indices exist today and try to be creative so that we can kind of um, continue to make progress on using the SOFR rate. Thank you. Uh, so from a regulatory policy perspective, we tend to be pretty razor focused on the, uh, on the needs of the, of the end users. So um, David spoke at length of the sort of the differences between uh, LIBOR and SOFR in our ears and so on and so forth. So the question, Tom, uh, to you is uh, how are the corporates uh, preparing? Uh, and then, you know, you have this two and a half years, I guess. Uh, so if you can sort of share some perspectives. Oh, happy to do that. Thank you all. Uh, in fact, this was a hot topic. We just concluded our National Treasurer's Conference a few blocks north of here uh, Thursday and Friday uh, of, of last week. And I can tell you that uh, the whole discussion about computing interest in arrears, uh, how complicated is that, is something that we've dealt with for a long time. Um, for uh, low investment grade corporates who are typically borrowing under their credit agreement instead of using it as a backup for commercial paper, they're trying to manage a mix of tranches between LIBOR borrowings, which are 
fixed for one month, two months, three months, six months, or with the consent of the lenders, 12 months, and have to be noticed two days in advance with uh, effectively prime borrowings, which can be obtained on, uh, on same day notice. And so what a treasurer does is come in in the morning, add up what uh, was received from customers last night, what needs to go out today to suppliers, employees, and other payments. And if, he, if that treasurer is short, uh, a prime borrow and, and is not a commercial paper issuer, then a prime borrowing gets made. Well, the convention that's been there for decades is that these prime borrowings uh, the treasury system and the bank uh, management system would go out, look at what the prime rate is of the agent bank, multiply that times the day's prime outstanding, and that would be just accumulated or accrued. It's not compounded. And then it's payable. So on April 1st, we paid for the first quarter uh, of what was borrowed and accumulated in, in, in interest. So we've been doing this for a while, and since, uh, as many of you know, Prime is usually about 300 basis points above uh, effective Fed funds rate, uh, we'd love to go to uh, a SOFR basis, uh, even with the kind of adjustment we've been talking about. So let's get into some of those adjustments. And, and one point that I'd just also like to make, um, as David, Tom, and the other ARC members know, that inverted pyramid that David showed with 200 trillion with a T of US dollar uh, LIBOR transactions really understates the true amount. Because one of the things that treasurers are busy doing now, and we talked about this last week uh, among our colleagues, was taking inventory of what we've got. Because the, the 200 trillion that was up there includes certainly committed credit agreements, so multi-currency credit agreements, term loans, floating rate notes, asset securitizations, all manner of derivatives, whether they be interest rate swaps, currency swaps, in order to hedge uh, raw material inputs or energy prices, we enter into commodity swaps. All those were covered in the 200 trillion. But here's what's not covered. Uh, every day, uh, part of what we're balancing out when we add up what came in and what needs to go out are payments that perhaps need to go out to foreign subsidiaries. Uh, if we're a multinational, we're, we're funding the worldwide group from the credit resources of the parent company, so we've got inter-affiliate and group loans. There are asset purchase and sale agreements that incorporate LIBOR. We've got long-term supply agreements where if we've paid a supplier for three years to build a major piece of capital equipment and that supplier is late despite the progress payments that we've made, we get a credit off the purchase price computed on a LIBOR basis. And so uh, we've even got empl uh, employee benefit payment obligations that are computed on a LIBOR basis. And here's my confession to you. Many of those things have followed form. So global procurement or human resources, whoever's doing it, had talked to Treasury, corporate Treasury five years ago and found out how we ought to structure those intercompany or inter-affiliate or uh, arrangements with employees, and they're still doing that. But we don't have an inventory in corporate treasury of all those agreements and who the counterparties are and what would happen if LIBOR went away or how we change it. And so uh, I agree completely with the, the expression of stop digging and start doing things, converting legacy agreements to SOFR. But here's what has to happen for a corporate treasurer. You've got to have certainty as to the tax, the accounting, and the regulatory treatment of what that switch is going to look like. Here's an example. Uh, in the US and in almost every other country, if you change the interest rate on a loan by more than a de minimis amount, that's treated for tax purposes as a redemption of that loan and a deemed issuance of a new loan. And the redemption of the old loan gives rise to the recognition of a gain or loss for income tax purposes. So it's a bad day for a corporate treasurer when you've been trying to get out ahead and amend loan agreements to take to switch them from LIBOR to SOFR, and then you find out that not only 
or your quarter your quarterly earnings are going to have a miss because your taxes have run up with the attendant hit to earnings because of that. So we need certainty from our uh, from the official sector. And for US based multinationals, we need that from the official sector in all the countries where we operate. My uh, company operates in 30 countries. And so one of the very important things that we've done, the ARC met with the Financial Stability Board consisting of the finance ministers of the G20 countries and, and other participants. And we've had, uh, we've begun conference calls with them to try to coordinate the, uh, inter, uh, the, the international treatment of these things. I mean, you can imagine if you get what I was hoping for from the US Internal Revenue Service and the Treasury Department, a deferral on the recognition of a gain or loss on that intercompany loan change or redemption, it would be bad news if it was an intercompany loan to a foreign subsidiary and that foreign country treated the switch over from LIBOR to SOFR as a taxable event, and you nevertheless had it uh, on that other end of the transaction. So we're coordinating this, and we've had many sessions with government agencies who control the accounting tax and regulatory treatments. Um, SAE is uh, representing the CFTC on the ARC. There are other uh, uh, U US uh, regulatory agencies and, and departments that are there. And um, so we're very, we, we've got some rulings coming out and some certainty gonna be provided. So we're, we're very glad to, to get that and to move ahead with uh, this changeover. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, so we understand that the, uh, the, the previous panel spoke about uh, some of the work that's happening in the context of the securitization markets. Uh, uh, Sarah, could you talk to us about some of the challenges as, as well as, you know, in particular, uh, how the participants in the ABS market preparing for the transition? Uh, for every time I sat on one of the calls, uh, I, I, you know, I just keep, keep reminding that it's really hard to sort of amend some of these contracts. So how are the firms uh, looking to mitigate uh, the risks and challenges? Sure, thank you. Um, as Lisa and Larry had pointed out in the previous panel, securitization is particularly complicated and it's not going to be all that easy to um, move over to another benchmark. Um, you have the securities, you have the collateral underlying the securities, and then in many instances you also have derivatives providing hedging. Um, you know, someone had mentioned that ARC is currently working on the consumer products working group fallback language, so the hope is that um, while that might need to be a little simpler, it will be as aligned as much as possible with the um, language that was just published for securitizations. And uh, I'll be the third person to uh, to urge people to respond to the ISDA consultation on the pre cessation trigger, because if we can have our triggers aligned, um, that would obviously be very beneficial. Um, in terms of preparation, uh, speaking with uh, several of our members, um, within SFIG, you know, we've noticed that some of the larger, more active members have set up really robust um, library transition offices that have been in place for at least a year. <clears throat> and they're, you know, they're, they're looking to size their exposure across the organization, determine, you know, key touch points across various functions, um, accounting, tax, operations, capital markets, et cetera. Um, I think there are some smaller organizations that um, probably need to get going uh, fairly soon. Um, you know, in terms of uh, getting prepared, I do want to, you know, highlight some of the, uh, you know, specific operational challenges that are found within the securitization markets, precisely because you have um, slightly different structures, a variety of asset classes, as Lisa had mentioned, um, and you have certain certain operational kind of um, differences between securitization and, say, floating rate notes, um, in, in which I don't want to get into a lot of detail, but in certain instances, for example, you might need um, additional days to to kind of figure out what your rate will be if you are using an overnight SOFR rate. Um, so just a couple, of, you know, a few obstacles the industry has to has to kind of work through. And I do think with a lot of sort of the operational changes and systems and vendor requirements, it will probably take at least 18 months, if not longer. So to David's point, probably uh, makes sense to get going sooner rather than later. Um, 
And then the biggest the biggest issue really is on the legacy side. You know, Larry had mentioned that um, for on the ABS MBS side, it is pretty much impossible to get 100% note holder consent to make changes as significant as a change you would need if you're making a benchmark um, change. Um, mostly because it's impossible to identify who all your note holders are. So there are different options folks are thinking about, including, you know, S Vegas starting a bondholder communication initiative, but um, it will take a while to kind of get folks um, kind of coalesced around a certain approach, although we do think the technology is now there to be able to identify folks. Um, um, in terms of some of our membership, you know, outside of just bondholder communication, which might not, you know, be effective in time for the LIBOR transition. Um, we have a lot of folks, particularly on the investor side, um, wondering whether, you know, and Dave is probably going to kill me here, if LIBOR can continue for a few extra years to close out um, <laughs> legacy deals, just for the legacy deals. <laughs> um, and then obviously the legislative approach is something folks are, you know, wanting to hear more about in the future. Um, and then just finally, beyond the legacy deals, um, the question is how will folks uh, deal with new deals moving moving forward? So obviously we spent a lot you know a lot of time getting this fallback language uh, together and finally published last week. Um, I you know I do think again in speaking with our with our industry, um, folks are still fairly uncomfortable um, going with a non-term rate. You know so all the you know maybe David should go on a roadshow uh, with all the corporates, but. Uh, um, and the and the issuers, but I think until we have one or two folks um, kind of dip their toes in the market, particularly around um, including the fallback language. So even if they're not, if even if folks are not issuing in SOFA right away, to at least ha you know we hope that people do start in, you know incorporating the language for you know new LIBOR deals. Um, I you know I think once we have a couple of kind of leading institutions go to market with more robust fallback language, um, we should probably see other folks start to follow. We've seen that sort of pattern in the past with other industry uh, changes. Thank you. Uh, Nadine, can you, uh, anything to add from the MBS uh, market perspective? Sure, just real quick. Um, obviously, we get a lot of questions on the legacy contract language, and um, as it was already identified earlier today that Tom mentioned, you know, the ARC continues to discuss how to treat those legacy um, LIBOR loans and securities, um, but that process is obviously going to just take time. Um, so one of the things that you've heard a theme about today is to then make improvements on the disclosures and language that you're using today. So I mentioned earlier the Consumer Products Working Group. Um, there's subgroups of this working group, and one of them is actually focused on new fallback language for the uniform instrument note, the mortgage note. Um, Fannie Mae and Wells Fargo are co-chairing um, this work stream. And the goal is in the next month or two to be able to provide um, a draft of this new fallback language to the ARC um, so that we could potentially move forward on a consultation for the uniform mortgage note. And again, this language would be used for um, ongoing LIBOR ARM products. And the hope would also be the product I mentioned earlier, the SOFR-based LIBOR hybrid ARM product may also use similar language. Um, to the point that was just made, I think the goal would be to keep the language as consistent as possible with what is out there. But again, um, based on this being a consumer product, um, what we're contemplating at this point is to keep it true to those principles, but obviously in a more simplified version. So it could be observ observable as well as easily understood by the consumer, as well as the other participants such as trustees um, or servicers that have to process the information. So um, hopefully I would encourage all of you when this information comes out this summer to please pay attention and provide um, any of the necessary feedback because again, these consultations are incredibly important to get everyone's voices heard and especially with a consumer product like an arm loan, it's going to be incredibly important to make sure that we're all on the same page. 
Thank you. Uh, so uh, the CFTC has published some uh, some studies about uh, an account of party uh, participation in the markets. And from what you have seen from the data that we have access to on the derivative side, uh, if you look at interest rate swaps, uh, there is a swap dealer in like 98.9999% of uh, the trades. Uh, so looking to uh, Alice first and then Brian, uh, can you talk to us about uh, you know how are you, in, especially in sort of dealing with clients, uh, preparing for the transition, and especially what are the clients doing? Sure. Um, you can imagine at a place like J.P. Morgan, given the scale and given the scope, our own internal um, process for dealing with this particular topic is quite complicated. I think early on, you know, having the advantage of having worked on many of the different working groups, not only in the U.S. dollar, but in the other currency, IBOR working groups as well, you know, we got great insight into how complex this potential transition was going to be. So what we ended up doing was um, we created a firm-wide oversight team that was sponsored by the head of the investment bank as well as our CFO. And then within each of the main business lines, we also had a senior sponsor set up a steering committee to really have oversight over the practical implementations associated with the consumer side, the investment bank, asset management, et cetera. On the one hand, that sounds pretty straightforward and simple, right? I think that you've got experts who are um, you know, responsible for their business lines, looking over their products, looking over their systems, looking over their models, et cetera. And then you've got this you know, broad oversight for the firm uh, indicating clearly uh, to David and others right, that we are seriously in this game and that we've um, stepped up to the operating committee level as well as the board level. So from that perspective, that was great. But I would say that you know, we can't oversimplify, and I think that that's been made clear by all the panelists, right? I think that, you know, we talk about LIBOR as if it's one thing, but in reality, it's so many different things. When you think about the number of contracts we're talking about, the number of products we're talking about, then the number of currencies, then you think about the number of systems, and you think about the number of constituents that are involved. I think that if I think about the you know, my own work in the investment bank, of which I've been there over 30 years, many of the different industry um, changes over time have been really uh, arguably very um, confined to the investment bank space or to the dealer space. This is one of the few times where the consumer side suddenly has been brought into the picture. And let me tell you, investment banking people are not really used to dealing with like the, the wants and desires of the consumer bank and vice versa. So that dialogue, even internally, has been extremely interesting, let alone when you bring in the uh, smaller clients that we have, obviously the private banking clients, and then, of course, the asset management clients, each one with its own set of issues, each one with its own priorities, and each one with its own concerns. So I would say that, you know, to be honest, the setup, while obvious, right, maybe the thing that was most critical to us was ultimately the communication. So the desire to educate our own people uniformly internally has been quite a challenge. The desire to give information out that is relevant and not overwhelming has also been an interesting challenge. And I would say the um, you know, newfound ability to really have people work together and make sure that um, decisions that are being taken in one side don't conflict or cross with some, another decision that's going to be taken. A great example would be something as straightforward as maybe disclaimers, where you want to give information to people, you want to highlight to people the idea that LIBOR is going to go away, for example. Well, certainly the consumer side versus the investment bank versus the folks who handle the mid-market may have different views on how complicated that language should be or where that language should be um, displayed. Should it be on the internet? Should it be in a document? Should it be emailed, et cetera? So this whole exercise, I think, has been, um, you know, it has really been eye-opening, to be, to be honest, right? And I know that across the dealer community, you know, I think we've all been um, pretty open about the idea of sharing and working together in terms of best practices, in terms also of making products available, right, to encourage uptake of, you know, all the new benchmarks, et cetera, right? But, you know, as with everything, right, this, it takes two sides, and this is another thing I think that has been quite complicated. You know, while we've been busy educating our people internally, we have also recognized, right, given the wide variety of 
clients that we ultimately have, right? Education on the outward side is equally important. Even if we were to get everything um, set up internally, even if we had all our contracts lined up, even if we were about to amend all our contracts or sign up with the protocol, if the other side hasn't done it, it's not really that helpful. So I think ultimately, um, you know, one of the main things that we've also learned from sort of our own internal exercise is that we really have to communicate outward much more so than we've ever done. Education is paramount and sharing, quite frankly, of information where possible is also critical. And I know that Brian's done a lot of work as well on this particular topic and concept, so I'll, I'll turn it over to him. Sure. Thanks, Alice. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I think at Wells Fargo, we have set up a similar organizational structure to what Alice described. Uh, they're doing at JP Morgan. I think it's really important, maybe, first of all, that, that you get the right people and the right number of people involved. You know, th this is a big deal. And, and I, I, over the past, you know, 16 months or so since we've set up our program office, it's been really interesting to me. Uh, to, to watch as, as it really starts to sink in how big a deal this is, right? Um, you know, at, at first, you know, there's the denial, you know, wh what do you mean? We're, everybody uses LIBOR. We've been using LIBOR for 100 years. Of course, we're not going to replace it. And then you move beyond that and you say, oh, my God, what, what is it going to take to actually do this and to do this in an arguably compressed time period, right? And so, you know, we concluded at Wells that we needed a, a team of people that were working on this full time that had the relevant subject matter expertise. So we've got over a dozen people right now in a LIBOR transition office that are working full time on this. Now we've, we've spent a lot of time mobilizing our institution, right, so that we have uh, several hundred people at this point that are at least working part time uh, on, on LIBOR transition. Ultimately, it's going to be several thousand people internally that are going to need to be involved when you think about, again, to Alice's point, the fact that this touches uh, the vast majority of our lines of business, it has a huge impact on our, our models that use LIBOR as a critical input or a secondary input. It has a huge input on, or impact rather, on our processes. Uh, from a technology perspective, uh, th this is gonna be a really big deal. I mean, I had kind of a oh my God moment when I, I stepped back to think about the fact that, and I think this is the case with really all uh, large financial institutions, we, we all have hundreds of thousands of LIBOR-based contracts that run past 2021, and they all explicitly say in there, well, a lot of them, the vast majority say explicitly what to do if LIBOR is unavailable. But that's never been tested, right? So, so we, we have these contractual obligations, right, that say what is supposed to happen if, if LIBOR is not available, yet that information lives in our documents, so to speak. So um, while we're obviously going to amend a lot of documents, while we're all going to start to use better fallbacks, we need to be able to, uh, to the extent we're not using SOFR out the gate or using SOFR now, we all need to be able to operationalize these fallbacks across hundreds of thousands of contracts uh, when LIBOR goes away. And to take what is effectively free form text in hundreds of thousands of contracts that has you know, a good deal of variation between products and even in, within some products, and to kind of put that freeform text into zeros and ones that systems can consume so that portfolios are valued correctly, so that customers are, are invoiced correctly, that's, that's a Herculean undertaking. And uh, we're, we're starting to do a lot of work around, you know, how do, how do we do that? How, how do we best go about doing that? At the same time, focusing on how quickly can we introduce um, how quickly and appropriately can we introduce SOFR-based product? And, and to that point, you know, um, as, Alice, as Alice indicated, you know, we've been doing our best to, to get out there and spread the word. And you know, at Wells Fargo, we have a large middle market franchise. And, and you know, we've observed that while there's a, a good awareness in the institutional space around you know, what's going on with respect to LIBOR transition, not, not quite so in the middle market space. It's not as uniform. So, so we've uh, created a, for lack of a better word, a LIBOR roadshow. And we've, we've gone to, you know, Birmingham, Alabama, Nashville, Tennessee, and, and Minneapolis, Minnesota, and a bunch of similar cities to talk to our middle market customers about LIBOR transition. I, I'd say, you know, we've done maybe three dozen events like this right now, and we continue to do them. And the feedback's relatively consistent. And um, it's first that 
they understand why, why LIBOR isn't really fit for purpose, why it's, why it's flawed, right? Um, and, and I think that's good. I, I think the other thing is, you know, we talked to them a lot about the fact that, yes, you're used to using LIBOR, uh, which is a forward-looking term rate, but there's very good reasons, not just that a term SOFR isn't available, but there's good reasons above and beyond that why we should be using or consider using SOFR in arrears, right, either on a simple average or compounded average basis. And we talked to them a little bit about that. And, and I, I see, again, in the middle mar our middle market customer base, a real willingness to engage around that. We just need to make it a little bit easier for them. And, and so, you know, I, I, I mentioned earlier about this idea of, um, you know, a SOFR index that's published either by the public sector or by uh, a, a, somebody in the private sector, some institution in the private sector. I think that's so important because right now, a lot of systems are set up to take a number. <coughs> You know, one month LIBOR, take that number, multiply it by a day count, multiply it by a principal balance. It's really easy. People understand it. They're used to it. Systems are set up to do, uh, to do it. If you want to move to compounding and, and you're not used to it and your system isn't set up for it, in order to do compounding, again, it's just math to David's point, but your system needs to consume, you know, dozens, arguably, of numbers and then do something with them. And it, and it needs to be really specific about what do you do to the margin? What do you do to the index? Do you compound them both? Do you compound one or the other? Do you treat weekends differently than you treat uh, 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 business days, right? Um, do you want to do it exactly the same as derivatives do? Or, or are there reasons to differentiate? And so I think if we can make it simpler to the point where there's an official SOFR-based index, right, and so with LIBOR you're just grabbing one number or your system is grabbing one number and dropping it in. Um, if you have an index where you could take really two numbers, right, the SOFR on one day and the SOFR on another day and any two days and really put one over the other and subtract one from it, I think that makes the transition that much easier. And so I think we're doing a lot at the ARC to think about, you know, how do we make this transition easier? Because our customers, again, in the middle market space, when we talk to them, they're, they're, they're willing to engage around this. We just have to make it a little bit easier. And I think, I think you know, more to come on that. Rich, quickly. Yeah, thank you, Zay. <clears throat> I think very, um, just to follow on to what, what uh, Brian is saying, because LIBOR is so uh, ingrained and this is such a complex infrastructural lift, um, I think there is an onus on us all uh, on, the, on the sell side to, our, our, and, and all participants specifically uh, with, uh, you know, and giving uh, ISDA um, feedback uh, on, 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 on fallback protocol. It, there's an onus on us all, I think, to keep this as simple as possible because this is so complex. Um, and in terms of, you know, how, we, how we're going to calculate, whether it be mean, median, uh, you know, time frame, et cetera, you know, for us to educate our cl uh, client base, um, simplification will help this process. I think, uh, the, secondly, I also, on the sell side, I think there's an onus on us all to commit uh, liquidity, uh, commit to liquidity and commit to liquidity provision in the product. Um, it's something that uh, for us, to, and, and I think for us to do that, I think all, 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 all uh, large sell side members need to have, you know, a, a universal voice that, you know, that, you know, so far is the future, uh, that to, to, for, to continue to tell our clients to prepare, to, to prepare back end, to prepare front end, and to pr prepare to take uh, so far index risk. Um, but I, uh, but uh, but mo most importantly, yeah, um, you know, to to, to lean in in a, in, a, in a particularly tough uh, market environment when you're at this inceptional stage, uh, it, it is quite difficult to to provide a large large amounts of liquidity. But the onus is on the sell side to provide this, which is something that you know we continue to try and do. Uh, Chris, uh, you want to educate us on what uh, the buy side is doing and how we're engaging with uh, the liquidity providers. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I mean, you know, one, one thing just to start out is, you know, I can't predict when, um, when LIBOR is going to go away, and I also can't predict when there's going to be liquidity throughout the curve. Um, one thing I take note of is that we are ahead of the original uh, PACE transition plan, so I have to have that uh, at the front of my mind. Um, what I can do is I can do things now 
uh, while time's on my side in things like uh, systems uh, and uh, education. So I think it's important to take this time now. Um, what does that involve? Uh, absolutely, I think it's important to inventory your risks. Uh, I think as we've heard from a couple people here too, I think it's important to gather a, a, a key committee uh, with important people in there and, and to interact with those people because again, um, this is something new, things aren't always so obvious and um, so it's good to have those interactions. Uh, I say for ourselves, uh, two key things happened. Obviously uh, back in uh, the summer of 2017 when uh, FCA's Bailey came out and gave us a date, the date was relevant to everyone. Um, I think the second thing uh, in the U.S. is when uh, the New York Fed started to produce a sulfur rate, now, now we had a rate. And I would say that in my company, that, is, that gained a lot of traction with people throughout the company. Uh, and that's when we started to form the committee and, and gather the risk. But uh, that certainly has been beneficial. Uh, again, things aren't always so obvious uh, when it goes to uh, capturing all those risks. Um, I think another thing that people will want to think about is uh, if we think about uh, a lot of different transitions on the way, like for example, uh, the talk of Big Bang PAI. This could be happening at the same time as the uh, phase five uh, initial margin phase in. Uh, that's gonna involve not only resources for your company, but it, re it's, it, it also requires resources for the entire uh, market. So I think you, uh, again, just another good reason to try to think ahead, start planning, start moving now. Um, we, we happen to have uh, put a couple, uh, a handful of trades through the, the market and most importantly, uh, the reason for doing that is, is to again, test systems, test your operations, uh, you know, accounting systems, things like that. So I would encourage you to, again, try to be part of the solution uh, because it benefits you as well as the market. Um, another thing that I think you've heard from everyone here and I will tell you that uh, engage on this topic. Um, and I will tell you that we've had tremendous success uh, with regulators, with uh, the, the clearing houses, uh, with banks, uh, with other customers. Again, the more you can, and everyone in here is actually taking a step forward with that by attending this today. So, but I think there's a lot to be learned uh, um, from others' experiences. And I think, uh, again, this is a, a problem for the entire market, not for the sell side, not for the regulators. So it's important for us all to come together and, and learn from each other and, and move forward together. Um, and, and again, I, I think, even if I think about the consultation, uh, if you haven't taken a look at the, the consultation, I will tell you for ourselves, just reading through the initial consultation, uh, that was educational and made us think about other things that we hadn't been thinking about before. Uh, and, and again, all of these people are really receptive to your ideas. Um, and, uh, uh, Let's see, uh, and I, I will say from a, from a buy side, I, um, I see the sell side moving beyond just kind of infrastructure things now. I think when we first saw pieces come out from the sell side, a lot of it was just around infrastructure, dates, things like that. There, there is certainly uh, much more engagement from the actual capital markets front end side of it. So uh, and again, that's just another sign that things are progressing and uh, I encourage you to engage people with that as well. Thank you. Uh, so Dick just said that if I don't shut up now and, and the panel, then he's going to kick me out. So thank you so much uh, for this. Thank you.